Hello and welcome to the Koyamungi Institute, our Q&A conversation for our exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the Executive Director and President of the Institute, and along with my wife, Laura Lee, the Director of Research, Education and Outreach. And on behalf of our Board of Directors, our advisors, volunteers, and supporting members, we want to thank you for joining us today. The Koyamungi Institute is an independent, nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness and the human experience following the footsteps of our founder, anthropologist Dr. Felicitas Goodman. And as an educational institution, we take it uh, an open approach and invite scholars in related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. That's why we call this conversation for exploration. And on these Sunday discussions, We've included a full spectrum of topics, neuroscience, anthropology, archaeology, archaeoastronomy, um, ecology, philosophy. It goes on and on on the ritual the the hero's journey the from the arts to the sciences. And you're welcome to visit our website at queermongainstitute.com. All of our presentations are free and as a nonprofit, we invite you to become a supporting member. And of course, we want to thank you, the community members who support the mission of the Queermongain Institute. Recently in this program, on, recently on this program, we've been talking about the elements of nature that shows up and grabs our attention from serpent clouds hugging the horizon, watching the full moon, greeting the sun, the interaction with nature, its signs, its symbols, a dialogue. There's something very profound and very satisfying about that. And on a personal note, it affects me deeply, whether in ceremony or expressing as an artist. For me, whether I'm building a ritual space or playing music spontaneously or sculpting from some found object, there's something so resonant with meaning in these small acts and connecting our hands to express what's something deep yeah. at the core of us and to align with something that goes beyond ourselves. So as we are all artists, I believe we're arranging our space to seek order, uh, beauty, and to make sense of the world. I think symbol and art lies at the core of our institute's work, but also at our own lives and the different ways that we approach life itself. And we'll discover today how deeply embedded that is, that it's within all of us. And deeply embedded. Um, as we talk with a cognitive uh, anthropologist, I just want to mention a couple of books. This, How to Think Like a Neanderthal. Really insightful. How much can be deduced from such scanty evidence? And then many happy hours I spent on this book, First Sculpture, Hand Axe to Figure Stone. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah to eye-opening, mind-opening, how we so readily and so enjoyably see animal shapes in clouds, see faces in rocks and cliffs. Um, we're gonna explain, he will explain that. You know, we live in Sedona where Snoopy Rock is a must-see for all the tourists. And I have to say that once you see Snoopy lying atop his doghouse in a rock formation, uh, you cannot unsee it, right? It's a must-see. My mother collected Japanese antiques and she was very fond of a small flat slab of rock that featured quite clearly a mountain with waterfalls and trees at its base. This was a natural object, the striations mm -hmm. and colorations in the rock. This was nature's art and an artisan had nicely and decoratively framed it. Very shibui, she would say. When mother nature is the artist, it's all the more special. Well, our guest today has a beautiful slideshow to share with us of extraordinary sculptures by artists who also worked in stone, finding faces, finding natural figures, also framing them very nicely, sometimes accentuating a feature here and there to bring out the face or the figure. And what makes this so startling, so intriguing, is that these artists were Homo erectus and Neanderthals. And that this art, this artifacts, uh, these artifacts date to half a million to over a million years old. From curators and collectors to artists, this is our neurons at work. This is our hard wiring for pattern recognition, um, for social hard wiring laid down very early in us as infants. Mm -hmm. We need that to help us recognize faces, to recognize mother, to read expressions and moods, to communicate non-verbally. That is our first language. 
and our guests will detail a whole lot more of how indeed Paul, art and meaning, order and beauty, is so deeply embedded in us. So welcome, uh, Thomas. Thomas Wayne, cognitive archaeologist. Um, and also, I have these books of yours to look forward to. I'm <laughs> collecting all your books. They explain so much to us. But I have to say, our introductions won't be complete until we also uh, thank Christine and Todd Van Poel, also advisors to our institute, who introduced your work to us and who I've asked today to help introduce you to our community. Uh, so welcome, all of you. Thank you. So Tom is uh, one of the leading archaeologists working on cognitive archaeology, and I, I'm sure a lot of people don't quite know what that term means, but it's an archaeologist who studies how humans think and also how the way that humans think impact the archaeological record. Everything we do, of course, impacts our thoughts, our behavior, our, our beliefs, our motivations, and whatnot. And Tom is one of those uh, special archaeologists who can take a look at the human mind look at how the human mind was formed, but also take that knowledge about how the human mind was formed to help us understand the archaeological record. And so it's a, it's a, a really neat approach. Uh, he's one of, the, one of the founding folk who, who came up with this, and he's the director for the Center of Cognitive Archaeology, the University of Colorado, which is a, um, and a, a very uh, useful and impressive research institute there at the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. A lot of good research has come out of there. Uh, one of the, the great things that Tom does is that he looks at what it means to be human in an interesting way. When uh, Chris and I are teaching classes, a lot of our students have questions about humanity and humans and Neanderthals and Homo erectus and whatnot. It's like, what would it be like to talk to these sorts of folk? And we can kind of speculate based on the archaeological record we see. And, you know, we can talk about, oh, well, these sorts of tools might not be the sorts of things that they would, would um, normally make, and they'd be very impressed by that. But uh, Tom's able to take a look at the, he's, he's got the basic knowledge to understand the workings of the mind, then the knowledge about the archaeological record to kind of put them together and talk about the way that the human mind helps structure what it means to be humans. And so when I when my students ask about this, I rely on his work a lot, especially work like uh, The Rise of Homo Sapiens, Evolution of Modern Thinking, which is a fairly recent book that's received a lot of attention in, in archaeology that he published. It, it, it's a great way uh, to, to address that issue of what it's like to, to be human and how the critters that came before us may have been similar, but may have also been very different in, in meaningful ways. I was fortunate to go out to Santa Monica and work with Tom and Tony on a different project, but it was a lot of fun to see before their book, um, First Sculptures was created, what they were doing in um, Tony's space. But you first mentioned this work to me. We had also been talking over the last couple of years about how ritual is about going back to right relationship with ourselves and our universe, right? And that we seek order, we seek beauty, beauty defined as being in right relation. And when you told me about uh, Tom's work, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so deeply embedded in us. Not only us, but the whole hominid family, that's where it started. I mean, it is at the core of us, so no wonder, no wonder that we have always sought to make sense of our world to see order, to see beauty. It's just programmed into us. Yeah. It was just the, the bells going off, the light going off, the angel singing. I thought, wow. <laughs> so yeah. this is why I got so, so very excited and so thankful for your work, Tom. And yeah. welcome. Yeah. Thank you. And that was, thank you. Thank you, Van Pools, for helping us introduce this. And yeah, wow. Where did your story begin? It, it, it's dangerous to ask an academic to look back over 50 years of uh, intellectual development. Uh, we, we like to um, retell our stories in creative ways that might not be entirely accurate. Um, <laughs> but uh, by my interest in anthropology started when I was in high school. And my sister was at uh, going to the university at uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. And she took some anthropology courses and said I needed to take a look at a couple of books. Um, I think I was a, like a junior in high school or something. And I read these books. One of them was The Forest People, a famous book by Turnbull that was popular back in, in the 1960s. And I went, oh my God, I've never heard anything like that before. And I thought it was really great. So I went to college uh, thinking that I was going to be an ethnographer. Um, and 
then I ran into archaeology. And it, my story is like a lot of archaeologists. We were drawn to archaeology by the field work primarily. And so after my freshman year in college, I took a field school in archaeology. And we worked out in the Mojave Desert, out on the China Lake uh, Naval Weapons Center, and uh, excavated a uh, number of recent prehistoric sites. And, you know, being a you know, 19 year old male, I thought this was just great because, you know, I could be out in the desert, which I loved, um, you know, drinking beer, which I also loved. Uh, and, uh, you know, talking about these things, you know, late into the night and then getting up in the morning and doing archaeology. I said, wow, this is great. Uh, I could do this forever. So why don't I become an archaeologist? Uh, and that's that's a fairly common, I think, uh, career arc for archaeologists. I was it's not particularly attracted to the intellectual questions at all, really, to be to be perfectly honest. And I didn't really get an, an interest in the more intellectual aspects of archaeology until I went to graduate school, where they more or less make you do that um, if you hadn't been doing it before. And a little history of archaeology is that in order back in the in the beginning in the late 60s and early 70s when I went to graduate school. Um, this was the age of what was called the new archaeology at, at the time, which was a movement in North America and Europe to make prehistoric archaeology more scientific uh, and to uh, make the use of, of theories more explicit uh, and to make more meaningful interpretations of the past instead of simply uh, cataloging things and giving them interesting names. Uh, the idea was to try to interpret what people were actually doing in, in, in the past. So this was all exciting stuff that was going on when yeah. I was- in, Ask the big questions school. and find answers. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, but I took a kind of funny direction because my background as an undergraduate was heavily based in structuralism. And structuralism was not a component of the new archaeology. Um, so my understanding of, of human culture was rather different from that of my fellow graduate students because of the nature of my undergraduate background. So I was kind of open to some other kinds of ideas. And then the, the next, next bit is sort of serendipitous, really. I mean, I was taking a graduate seminar in what at the time was called primitive technology. And there were, I think, six of us in, in the seminar. And the, uh, the person teaching the seminar, who happened to be my graduate advisor, came in the first day and had six slips of paper and handed everybody a slip of paper. And on the slip of paper was a name. And he said, go find out what these people are talking about and whether it is useful for understanding technology. And just by chance, I got Jean Piaget, who, who at, at the time was the uh, world's leading developmental psychologist. So I went off to the uh, library at the University of Illinois, which had everything Piaget had ever written, um, and started reading. And at the time, you know, I thought it was kind of interesting, um, but I didn't see that it would have any relevance to what I was interested in, which was early stone tools. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of put it to the back of my mind. And in the meantime, I'd gone to Africa uh, to do my first field work in Africa. And then I was pondering PhD topics and was uh, wandering across the quad at the University of Illinois. And I had this massive aha experience where suddenly everything sort of came together. I actually stopped. I, I can actually point the spot in, in, in the quad where, where I came to a dead stop when I realized, well, actually, you know, you could use Piaget to interpret the archaeological record. Um, and so that's what I did my dissertation research on. That's the basis of the little orange book you held up. Um, that was basically my, uh, my, my dissertation research, um, published about 10 years later. But, uh, and so that got me going in, a, in a, a kind of funny direction that most of my colleagues were not very comfortable with initially, which is the idea that we can look at the archaeological record to tell us something about how the mind was working. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like a very basic idea, but it was not uh, very well received um, initially when, when I was trying to, to publish it. But that's what got, got me started back in the, in the 1970s. And I have been uh, doing that ever since. Uh, my focus is really on the evolution of the human mind, uh, in particular, the evolution of certain kinds of cognitive 
abilities. Unfortunately, as I think most of you know, the, the Stone Age record, in particular the Paleolithic record, the early Stone Age record, Scanty. is impoverished. Mm -hmm. That's kind of an optimistic view of it. Um, there's very little left uh, after hundreds of thousands of years. Yeah. We get stone tools. If we're lucky, we get some bone. If we're really, really lucky, we get some other things, but it doesn't happen very often. So we have to try to reconstruct what happened over the course of three million years based on a really fragmentary archaeological record. And because of that, there are only relatively few things we can say about human thinking in the past. But I think we can say them fairly reliably. So even though it's an, an impoverished kind of record, uh, I think it's a reliable record, to, especially if you are careful in the way that you apply it. So initially I was, I talked about something that turns out most people find to be extremely boring. I thought it was exciting, which is spatial cognition. That is, how do you think about space? You know, how do you move in space? How do you think about space? And my initial uh, publications were all kind of related to spatial cognition. And uh, in the year 2000, uh, Fred Coolidge walked into my office when I was the associate dean, and he had this great idea about something else, uh, which is what, what he, we now call the working memory hypothesis for the evolution of modern humans. And he and I have been working on that for the last 20 years. And so that's another piece of what I've been doing, which really focuses more on the appearance of modern humans than on what Homo erectus was doing. And then the third thing, which is relevant to what we'll be talking today, see, I'm trying to do this briefly, um, is Tony Berlant. And in yeah. 2012, uh, actually it was November of 2012, I was sitting in my office uh, trying to be creative and uh, you know, productive. And I got a phone call from uh, Tony Berlant and he said, is, is this Tom Wynn? And I said, yeah. He says, is this the Tom Wynn that studies hand axes? I said, yeah. I said, oh, I got your name from Jill Cook at the British Museum. Um, do you have a few minutes to talk? And I said, sure. And we talked for an hour. Um, no problem <laughs> at all. Um, and Tony had an idea that uh, he wanted to put together an exhibition of early stone tools in an art museum venue. Mm -hmm. And he actually had gotten uh, a tentative agreement from uh, Jeremy Strick at the Nasher Sculpture Center in Dallas, Texas. And uh, he asked me to come out to LA and uh, go into his studio and, and talk to him about it. And I said, sure, I'd do that. So first week in January, I, I flew out to LA. And I should say, for, for, for Chris and Todd's benefit, I walked into Tony's, uh, Chris has been there, to Tony's studio. And the first thing I see is not a, not a hand axe or a stone tool. The first thing I see is a members bowl staring me in, in, in the face. <laughs> uh, and uh, I was just more or less gobsmacked by that. But um, that's not why I was there. I, uh, let me give you a little background on Tony. That's probably appropriate because this is largely Tony's project. And unfortunately, Tony can't be with us today, so he can't. Um, I can put words in his mouth and he can't say otherwise. Okay. <laughs> um, but um, Tony is an American artist who's uh, um, been very productive over the last 50 years. Um, he worked with Andy Warhol in New York in the early 1960s and in the late 1950s. And it has a very interesting style that he's developed himself. Uh, but in the 1970s, he developed a, an interest in North American uh, archeological remains. Well, first it started off historical remains. He was very interested in Navajo blankets. Um, and he is arguably one of the country's authorities in Navajo blankets. Uh, especially historical Navajo blankets. I think he knows every known historical Navajo blanket individually can tell you where it came from, who owns it. Um, so that got him very much interested in um, Southwestern Native American artistic traditions. Um, and in the 1970s, he got together with another archeologist, a fellow named Stephen LeBlanc, uh, who was at Harvard University, because they were very worried about 
archaeological sites in southwestern New Mexico in the Mimbres Valley that were being destroyed by people using heavy equipment to excavate for member ceramics, um, which, were, which were very valuable. So he and Stephen LeBlanc got together and established what at the time was known as the Members Foundation. And Tony contacted a number of wealthy people in the Southwest that he knew from the art community. And they established this foundation to actually buy the properties on which the archeological sites uh, existed. Right. And this was the beginning of what, what became the, I think the archeological conservancy. Um, and so, so Tony was very interested, not just in uh, Native American art, but in trying to preserve our archeological resources. So Tony was, and that's what Tony did for, for 30 years. He was very interested in these issues. Um, and he spent a lot of time in, in the Southwest. And sometime in the late 1990s, I think it must've been about 1997, um, he was in uh, Boston um, visiting Tony LeBlanc, at, not Tony LeBlanc, but Stephen LeBlanc at, at Harvard. And he was down in the Peabody Museum and he was waiting for something. And he looked and there were all these hand axes lying out on a table and he'd never seen these things before. Uh, he'd never really thought about them. And uh, he asked uh, Steve LeBlanc about them and Stephen told him what, what he knew, but he, Tony became very fascinated in these early stone tools and added that to his portfolio of things that he was interested in. And among other things, he'd started to collect them. Now, th this was very new to me. I never knew anybody collected hand axes. I mean, you know, I've been studying hand axes for 40 eBay. years. Yeah. yeah, and I didn't know people collected them. I didn't know there was a market. That's an interesting question we might address later. But, um, but so I foolishly asked Tony before I came out if he wanted me to bring some hand axes and he just laughed at me. He said, no, 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 I have a few. He had more than a few. Um, and, uh, and one of the things when, when you go to, to Tony's studio is he has this, this big case right in the middle that's filled with hand axes. And they're, they're in drawers. And there, are, there were, if I remember correctly, 129 hand axes in this. Um, and so I started looking at his hand axes. Like, this is this is great. You know, I Can we just, just stop for a minute? A hand axe isn't just really an axe. Do you want to describe for our audience what? Well, I actually have one right here. Yes. There, there we go. go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, this is, it's a stone tool, um, and this is the basic shape of a hand axe. It's kind of has a teardrop shape to it. Um, the nice thing about them is they do kind of fit in the hand, mm -hmm. um, and they're made of rock, they're, they're flaked out of stone. And but one of the things Tony and I did, started doing was handing hand axes to people to see how they would hold them. And almost invariably, people will hold them like this. Mm -hmm. um, and I suspect mm -hmm. there's, there's something really, really deep in that. That is, remember, we made these things for one and a half million years. And there's got to be something in here that's tied to that. And one of those things I think is really very haptic, tactile about how one, see, I'm gesturing with it. You can't see me, but you know, if I were lecturing, I'd be gesturing with this hand axe. Um, and this whole idea that there, there's a, a way we understand the world that uh, is connected to our bodies and to our, uh, our artifacts is, is something that Logical. our archeologists have, have not paid much attention to until probably the last 30 years. Uh, and it's becoming a, an important part of cognitive archaeology. It's sometimes called material engagement theory or uh, embodied cognition. And there are ways we know the world that we cannot verbalize very well because it's nonverbal. So deeply um, embedded in us. And, yeah. and, and, some, and some of them are, are quite profound. But anyway, from, from that point, uh, Tony and I, you know, I agreed to work with uh, the National Sculpture Center was very generous. Uh, it's the only time I have ever flown business class in my life. Um, uh, they also sent our spouses with us, which I thought was, that's very non-academic. You know, you can't, can't have spouses, no, not, not allowed. So, and, so Tony and I um, spent several years, you know, going to Europe and the Middle East and, uh, and Africa, uh, going to museums, looking for artifacts to include in this exhibition. Uh, and... Uh, the exhibition occurred in uh, 
2018. Um, and I suppose I should go to the share screen. Well, I just want to say Tony being a sculptor really had a different perspective that was so needed to truly see what these these artifacts were, to see the artistry in them. Yeah, uh, Tony, partnership. There, I, I, a it's couple a of things I'll, I'll, I'll say ahead of time. But um, one of the things that I found out the very first day, uh, Tony and I were at a the first museum we went to, which was outside of Paris. Uh, and we were and we pulled out a drawer full of artifacts. He, both of us just grabbed for the same artifact at the same time. And, uh, and this happened all the time. I mean, there, there's something that just clicked for both of us about particular artifacts. And I tried to reconstruct a little later about what that was about. Uh, and it does have to do with the visual impact of the artifact. Um, I could then explain all kinds of things about the artifact. And, but what Tony would talk about is why he thought the artifact had visual appeal. And, and being an artist, he was not really interested in um, the kinds of close level analytical things that archaeologists tend to be interested in. He was more interested in basically the general gestalt. That sure. is why, why this artifact is appealing. You know, why would anybody want to look at this? Uh, why is it um, why is it special? Why does it have power? That that's a term that, that Tony used a lot. Um, I never, I still don't use it. Not meaning. It's it's yeah. kind of out, outside of my my skill set. But um, but I learned a lot from from Tony from doing that from from looking at artifacts in in particular ways. And why are artistic choices made in the stone napping of a particular rock? Why that rock? What's special about that rock? And figure stones as well. You're going to show us figure stones. About yeah, I'm going to show you some, 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 some figure stones. And yeah. um, one, my... How does something come from utilitarian to, the... to, to art? There's a journey there, a cognitive journey which is what I think is so beautiful that you've been, you and he've been showcasing that cognitive journey. Yeah. A, a, a couple of, of things I, I learned early on with Tony, almost immediately. Uh, one is he doesn't want to define art and doesn't want to talk about defining art. So Good. we're not going to go there. Like um, um, <laughs> and, <laughs> because it's an experience, right? Yeah. And, and the other one, uh, which I'm, I think is linked to his abstract expressionism, uh, is that uh, he doesn't want to talk about beauty. Uh, he uh, more or less he more or less forbid the term. You know, um, whenever I would say this artifact is beautiful, he would <laughs> um, sort of sort of wrinkle up his face. It, it, it's a term he he doesn't use, but and we might talk about that a little bit because I think actually we maybe should be using it in certain <laughs> circumstances. But but I understand his. Yeah his point of view. Um, okay, um, I'll, I'll just start with this is a good in, introductory slide. The, uh, the, the exhibition occurred in uh, early 2018 uh, in Dallas, Texas, and the National Sculpture Center gave us a very nice space. I don't know if any of you have ever been there, but it's a, it's a very nice facility and we had the, the central gallery and they mounted the stone tools in, in very useful ways where people could walk around them and see them in three dimensions. And the figure stones you'll see in the back did the same thing as well. And there wasn't a lot, in fact, there's virtually no natural history information provided, which I thought was, was very important if we were going to do this as a, uh, an art exhibition as opposed to a natural history exhibition. So the, the, the labels on, on the vitrines would you know, identify just very basically what the artifact was, where it was from, maybe an estimate about how old it was, and that's it. And then the, the artifact would then speak for itself. That, that was the, uh, the basic idea behind it. So anyway, this is a, uh, a photo of uh, Tony and me outside the National Museum of Archaeology outside of Paris in Saint-Germain in um, 2013. Um, what we didn't realize that day as we went out, that that's the day the museum was closed. Uh, but but we, we had set up to, to talk, 
talk to one of the people there and we eventually managed to get in and, and take care of it. So what I'd, I'd like to do a little bit and uh, um, Paul and Laura, feel free to interrupt me um, and ask questions about some of these artifacts. I thought I would go through the, the catalog um, basically in order and talk about some of the artifacts and why we included them in the exhibition. So the earliest artifact is a, well, not technically, it's not the earliest artifact. I'll say something about that in, in a minute. This is a very basic stone tool. It's called a chopper. It comes from the famous set of sites in Tanzania of Olduvai Gorge. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's an artifact from the very bottom of the gorge. So it's the, mm -hmm. some of the very earliest stone tools that were produced at Olduvai Gorge. And it basically, it's just a big pebble of lava and if you look closely, you can see that there been, excuse my essential tremor makes this a little bit difficult sometimes. So there've been these pieces knocked off like that. Mm -hmm. And it produces a sinuous edge, which you can use to cut. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, these, these are examples of the very earliest stone tools. The goal seems to have been the flakes more than the actual core itself because the flakes would be very sharp and they'd use the flakes to cut things. Now, if we talk about the evolution of aesthetics, um, which is what Tony and I were talking about, uh, this artifact doesn't really tell us very much. Um, the, the individuals napping this artifact were not interested in imposing any shape or any form on the artifact. It was simply the result of a motor procedure. And is it a procedure for producing sharp flakes? The, after they use the sharp flakes, they threw them away and they were done with because it. Because they dulled um, out, right? And even yeah. surgeons today, some like to use obsidian flakes, right? Because they can cut. They, so that precisely. was popular for a while. I don't think they do it too much anymore because lasers are even better than obsidian flakes. Ah, but, right. um, but yes, it is true that if you, if you know what you're doing, you can make an obsidian flake that is so sharp it's sharper than a surgeon's scalpel, and you can make a finer cut with it. These hominines back, um, this artifact's probably almost 2 million years old, two million uh, years were old. not really interested in doing that. What they were interested in is getting something to eat. Pretty simple. And they, they were using these sharp stone flakes to cut uh, and butcher animal remains. They were probably scavenged animal remains, but uh, cut animal remains. But the, the important point for us here is that this is our starting point. That is, the hominins are producing our artifacts, but they're not imposing any kind of shape on them. They're not imposing any kind of form on them. But starting about 1.8 million years ago, hominins started doing something different. Um, this is a, an artifact called a spheroid for obvious reasons. It's round um, and it's from the side of Ubedia in Israel. It's about 1.6 million years old. It's big. Um, it's about eight to nine inches in diameter. It's very heavy and somebody has knocked flakes all around this. So basically this is a manufactured artifact that is round. And as far as we can tell, it wasn't used for anything. Hmm. And Definitely. that's an that's an interesting puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, um, why would you make something so large, so heavy, um, in a particular shape? Um, and we actually don't have a good answer to that um, uh, for an artifact that that's, that that's large. But what it does is allow me to introduce this idea of imposing shape or imposing form on the material world. One of the things that I, I could add to the project was some understanding of human cognitive abilities. Um, and in particular, I, I consulted a literature known as neuroaesthetics. And neuroaesthetics studies the neurological and cognitive bases of aesthetic performances and aesthetic appreciation. And what neuroaesthetics tells us is that there's not one part of the brain that's involved in aesthetic experience. There are several interconnected 
neural networks that the brain falls back on in aesthetic experience. And one of these is the perceptual network, that is your ability to perceive things. And a lot of what we see in the stone tools turns out to be a way to gain pleasure from that perceptual network that we came with as primates. Um, and one of the things that we're good at, primates are good at, is perceiving symmetry. That is, we perceive bilateral symmetry, we perceive radial symmetry. There are neurons in our visual cortex that are dedicated to seeing symmetry. And this probably goes back a long way evolutionarily. If you it's think about it. It's a survival mechanism, isn't it? Yeah, it's a survival mechanism, precisely. I mean, if you see something that's bilaterally symmetrical, it's almost certainly a living organism and it might be able to eat you or you might be able to eat it. So being able to perceive it quickly is a good idea. So this is probably old in an evolutionary sense. It probably goes back a long way in vertebrates. Um, the question then becomes for us, not whether you can perceive a symmetry, but why would you impose it on an object? And that's something that no other primate does. That is, we are the only primates that impose symmetry on objects. And we started to do it about 1.8 million years ago. And what Tony and I suggest in the the, the catalog in the exhibition is that we do it because it gives us pleasure. That is, it, it is a pleasurable activity to do. And I'll show you a few more spheroids um, because some of these spheroids are really stone balls. This one is one of my favorites. It's again from Old of Igorge from, from bed two. Um, it's almost a perfect sphere. And somebody produced this by bashing this rock against a harder substrate to sort of round it out. You get the Lewis Leakey thought these were bolus stones. That is, the, the early hominids were using them as bolus oh, to bring in the animal. Um, they don't need to be round if that's what they're doing, it turns out. So the roundness is something else. And I think the roundness, again, is a matter of eliciting a pleasurable response. They liked how these things looked, just like we like how these things look. That is, the rounder they are, the nicer they look, the more we're applied to go, ooh, that's kind of cool. Let me pick that up. How much place. work is it to grind a stone and shoot uh, it into a sphere? It, it depends on how round it is initially. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's something that if you have a, a nice kind of grinding stone available and you have a few hours, you can probably pull it off. Um, but it's, it's usually something that's going to take multiple hours to do. Um, Could we invoke the flow stake of Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, a focus task that's also creative, that in, in, embraces your whole attention? That I mean, could could that be possible that early on? Um, yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me, I have to clear my get a drink here. Because flow states are very enjoyable to enter into, right? right. And they're very healing for the brain. He says. Right. So. Yeah. And, Again, some things seem to be, at least I think, are probably out of our reach. And one of them is the precise motivation for why somebody did this. Um, but I think we can say some things about it. And one of it is that the visual impact of the artifact was pleasurable. And that's one of the reasons they were doing it. And here's a bunch of other spheroids in case you had never seen them before. The curious thing is, is archeologists have largely ignored them. There hasn't been a lot of work done on spheroids. Um, they've, they've been sort of a curiosity and they occur very early. We find them in 1.2 million year old sites in Spain. We find them in, in the Middle East. We find them throughout Africa. Uh, and after a few hundred thousand years, they sort of fall out of fashion. If you can even use the term fashion over the course of 200 or 300,000 years. Uh, and we don't know exactly what they were used for um, or if they were used for anything. They could have been you know, plant processing tools. There are a lot of things they might have been used for. But we're into, what we're interested in here is not so much what they were used for, but what they looked like and the visual impact and why a hominine two million years ago would be interested in making them. 
Is there no relationship then to cupules? Because we have seen in shrines, um, even on the Cuyamaga Institute land, shrine stones that have cupules, um, and there'll be a small round ball next to it that was used to make the cupule, and maybe it was a, a function of just grinding away stone for whatever purpose. The ball become the. The, the ball becomes the grinding round. stone becomes round. Yeah. Is there any? Or is that the much, much, much later? Um, we don't really find anything like a, a, a cupule, uh, probably until half a million years. Uh, and there, there's some sites in India that that have them. They're also associated with hand axes. Interestingly, um, hmm. it, I'm, it's not that they maybe weren't there, but nobody's really looking for them, and nobody's ever recognized them. Uh, in in this kind of antiquity, um, I would not be surprised to see them, um, but I don't know of any examples that are this old. So, um, so let let me move on a little bit. Um, th this is a hand axe. We've been talking about hand axes. I I would talk about hand axes for the next eight hours, and you would <laughs> all be terminally bored after about twenty minutes. Um, as one of my graduate student friends said to me long ago uh, about um, why folks stopped making hand axes. He said, well, they'd making a million and a half years and they finally got it right and they quit, um, <laughs> which, which is sort of a classic graduate student kind of way of understanding these things. But um, there's something to that. Um, so a, let me talk a little bit about hand axes. Um, first of all, Um, that's an old term was introduced about 200 years ago by archaeologists. Uh, and although they were probably held in the hand, they were almost certainly not axes. That is, they probably were almost never, if ever, used to try to chop down a tree or do a, a, some kind of serious axe work. Um, right. So it's a misnomer, but, it, but it's a term that has was introduced long ago and has stuck, and I'm quite fond of it. I'm not going to give it up. Um, so, uh, the, the, this is a classic example of a hand axe from Moldavite Gorge, one of the early hand axes. Um, and it's kind of a beautiful artifact because they, they made it out of quartz. And it, if you hold this artifact in the right light, it's sparkly, it sparkles. It really visually is, is, is a very interesting uh, artifact. The photo doesn't really make that very clear, but let me try to explain what a hand axe is. Um, I like John Gallet's uh, account of what a hand axe is. He wrote one of the um, essays in, in the catalog. And the point John makes is that the, the hand axe is really a large cutting tool. And it is, the, I guess we could use the term instantiation of, several ergonomic ideas, if we can use the term ergonomic ideas. And what the hominins needed was a long cutting edge because they were, they were trying to do a lot of really heavy duty cutting. So they needed this long edge. To be more efficient, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and, but they also needed to hold it in the hand. So two of the things that John talks about are what he calls um, forward extension, which is the length of the artifact. Mm -hmm. So compared to the early chopper, you remember the early chopper I showed? Yep. So right. this has forward extension away from the palm, and then it would be held down at this end. Mm -hmm. um, the term he uses for it is glob butt, which I think is a great term, <laughs> but um, it hasn't caught on. But so the idea is that the, most of the weight of the artifact is going to be down at this end. Um, where you can grip it uh, and get some stability, and then it's going to have this long cutting edge extending out. And these are ergonomic principles. These have these have to do with how the artifact is wielded and how the artifact is used. And this is why the hand axe exists, is because of the need for a large cutting tool held in the hand. And then some other things. Let me see if I can get a better one up here. For a second. Well, I'll come back in a second. Better do this one. Okay. Um, one possibility would be to make old be a long, skinny artifact. But you think about it for a second. If you had a long, skinny artifact and you tried to do heavy work with it, what's the problem going to be? It's going to break. It's going to twist in your hand. 
And so what you need is this dimension also. Um, so this, the fact that they're wide tools keeps them from twisting badly while they're being used. So those are three ergonomic principles right there. Then they're kind of heavy. So if you're gonna use a hand tool and it's really heavy, you tire out easily. So one of the things you wanna do is reduce the thickness of the artifact um, because that makes it lighter. And so you get reduced thickness. So, and all of these things are features of the artifact that make it easy to wield and produce the kind of um, functional artifact that we call a hand axe. I have more about to say about these in, in a second, but we first need to talk a little bit about this, which is, is a famous artifact in archaeology. It's called the Makopan's Gut Pebble. And it's about two and a half million years old. Um, and it is not technically an artifact because it is not a modified object. This is a natural pebble. Um, it's about three inches in diameter. And it was found at the site of Makapanskat uh, back in, I think, 1924 by a school teacher who gave it to Raymond Dart, who was uh, the archaeologist, not the archaeologist, but the paleoanthropologist working in the area at the time. And it was found on the surface of the site, but it's not a local stone. It's made out of jasperite. Um, jasperite is found several kilometers away. Um, so it's not a matter of it being a natural rock there. Somebody carried it to Makapanska. And how could you um, not, looking at that, how could you not pick it up and carry it? Well, it, it, exactly, it, exactly. Now, from an archaeological point of view, there are real problems with provenience because it's a surface find at an archaeological site. How do you know your cousin George didn't carry it there 50 years ago and leave it behind? Well, there's no way to eliminate that possibility. It just doesn't seem very likely. It seems more likely that hominins living at the site two and a half million years ago did. A lot of people have said some, I think, little bit inflated ideas about what this means. Um, does this mean that the hominins had an elaborate symbolic system? No, it doesn't. Remember, these hominins are primates. And one of the things primates are very good at is detecting faces. Um, we look at people's faces very carefully all day long because they carry lots of important information about social interactions. Mm -hmm. So primates, especially anthropoid primates, you know, monkeys, apes, and humans, are very sensitive to seeing faces. Mm -hmm. So the possibility that a two and a half million year old hominin picked up this pebble and saw a face is not surprising. Almost certainly they did. Really the two questions we have to address is why were they looking at this thing in the first place? <laughs> and why did they carry it away? Um, and I think the reason they were I think the reason they were looking at it in the first place is that they made stone tools and they were they look for rocks that may, would make either useful stone tools or especially useful hammer stones. This thing is about the right size to make a decent hammer stone. And I can imagine an early hominin saw it there, picked it up and then saw the face and was surprised by it, pleased by it, fascinated by it and decided to carry it along. Um, simply because it gave him or her pleasure. Um, and that's really the issue we're getting at, is the kind of pleasure that visual phenomena provide to early hominins uh, through their artifacts. And so I don't find the Makapanskot pebble to be particularly difficult to explain. Um, I think it in fact is fairly straightforward to uh, explain and it has to do again to our visual processing system mm -hmm. and the kinds of things that give us pleasure when we look at them. It also has multiple faces and in your book you show it upside down and then you see it. It does and I, I thought faces. maybe I should go in and show it upside down but I couldn't find the upside down image. Mm -hmm. um, Tony being kind of an iconoclastic guy was always thought the upside down image was more interesting than the right side up image. But, contemporary. <laughs> but Tony's not here, so we'll do it my way. Okay. Um, okay, let's let's go back to hand axes again Another because we phase. have a lot to say about hand axes. Um, and this is one of the early earliest hand axes known. It's from the um, Kenyan side of Kukisili. 
Uh, it's almost 1.8 million years old. It's a classic example of all of those things John Gallup talked about. It has forward extension, it has a glob butt, it's got lateral extension, um, it's got a nice bifacial edge trimmed along here, and it has reduced thickness. So this is a classic example of a hand axe. But what comes along, I think is, is kind of interesting. It is also bilaterally symmetrical. Mm -hmm. And this idea of bilateral symmetry becomes important. Um, this might simply have been accidentally bilaterally symmetrical. That's possible. Um, but early on, we find artifacts that are, we'll come back to them, almost certainly not accidentally bilaterally symmetrical. There's, there's a term I use in, in the catalog called overdetermination. It's kind of a big word. What it means is that the hominid invested more effort in the shape of the artifact than was necessary to produce the ergonomic form. In other words, they're investing more into the visual appearance of the artifact. Um, and this is really the, the theme for hand axes for a million years, is this idea of overdetermination and investing them with visual appeal. Um, this is a hand axe from Niger. Um, and right away, we're going to show some, some things that people don't really expect of hand axes. Um, if you look at this, there's a face. I mean, there's, there's very clearly a face on this artifact. If you didn't see it, you're an engineer. How's that sound? <laughs> but anyway, it's got a mouth here. It's got a nose. It's got an eye here. Um, and this is something that I was a little bit surprised at. And, and, and Tony had told me ahead of time that he was interested in this aspect of, of hand axes. Uh, and I at first didn't think much of it, but what I discovered that looking at thousands of hand axes, it's, this is far more common than I thought it was. And that's using the hand axe as a kind of framing device for other kinds of images. And in this case, the, the, the hominin is not making the face. The hominin is using the hand axe to frame the face, to draw attention to the face. Um, and it's, it gives pleasure. I mean, it, as soon as you plug into the idea that this is a face, you cannot not see the face any longer. Um, and this is one of my, my favorite art artifacts from the exhibition. I don't actually know the age of this artifact. It, it's a surface find. But the fact that it was so beautifully framed indicates that the hominin also saw the face. Yes, I, I think all, almost certainly. And when you look at how the artifacts were trimmed, same thing. This is a similar artifact from France. Um, and you can see again, there's basically a face in this artifact. Um, and you could say, oh, it was just accidental. They didn't do it. But I don't think so. If, if you look at the way the, the artifacts are, are flaked, I think it's pretty intentional. Oh, this, is, this is one of my favorites. This is from the um, Israeli site of Geshe Benat Yukov, which is 800,000 years old. Um, it's quite an old site. And this is a cleaver. The difference between a cleaver and a hand axe is that a cleaver has what's called a bit at one end as opposed to a point. <coughs> and, and this also- a very useful angle, I'm assuming, for a tool, can it not? Yes, that's what's called a guillotine bit cleaver. Um, and a lot of them are like that. But I think you can all see the face on this. It's a very nice mask. It's, it's kind of a stunning artifact. Um, and this is what this is one of Tony's favorites. T Tony thinks this is a cat, and that kind of looks cat-like. Mm -hmm. You've got the ears up here, and you've got the eyes. Yeah, um, it's like an abstract sculpture. Yeah, yeah, and the, uh, Tony is quite fond of the modern art museum. Yeah. Well, that's the idea. <laughs> and actually, one of the interesting things that the Nash Sculpture Center did is in the adjacent gallery to the one with the stone mm, tools, okay. they, they mounted um, 20th century and late 19th century sculpture that had been influenced by prehistoric art. Yeah. Um, so it, it, made, it made a very nice contrast. In fact, I 
kind of like the gallery more than the hand axes, but then I knew the hand axes. So, it's a nice um, bookend, isn't it, to have those two? Right, right. And, and again, what, what we're seeing here is that there's, there's a visual impact that the artifact has that's not linked to its utilitarian job. Yeah. Um, it's doing something else for some other purposes. And we use the term aesthetic. It's an aesthetic appeal. I don't, again, I'm going to stick, stay clear of the term art, um, but it's very old. These, the, the, again, the hand axe from um, Geshem Rao Yaakov is 800,000 years old. This hand axe is probably more like 500,000 years old. Wow. Um, so it's a youngster uh, by, by the standards. Wow. Um, this is I, one of my favorite hand axes from the exhibition. It's from a Algerian side of Tabulbala, and it's a very late hand axe. Well, I'm going to come back later and talk about some other hand axes from Tabulbala, but this is this is a, a classic hand axe, and it allows me to talk about several things in terms of visual appeal. First of all, this is an overdetermined form. That is, somebody invested a lot of effort to produce this artifact. It's also pretty big. It's, you know, it's almost 11 inches long. It's a big artifact. The tip was broken off, but we've glued it back on, so it, it's fine. It's bilaterally symmetrical, not just vaguely bilaterally symmetrical. Beautiful. Somebody set out to produce as precise a bilateral symmetry as possible. Remember, they're making these artifacts by knocking pieces off of stone. Um, it's so not did like- Michelangelo, yeah. Yeah, just like Mike, Michelangelo. Um, and Tony even talked a little bit about whether they saw this in the stone ahead of time or whether the process, it emerged during the process. And I think it's, it's a very appropriate uh, discussion. I'll show an artifact in uh, a second, which, in, which I'm almost certain that the Napper visualized the whole thing ahead of time. Um, this one, I think it's, it's very likely that that was the, the case. Um, it's also and, very smooth on the edges as well. Right. Um, what, one of the things that actually does evolve over the course of hand axes is some technological tricks that the nappers use. And if you look closely on this, what you can see is the napper was occasionally knocking some really big flakes off mm -hmm. um, that were extending way into the center of the artifact. And then there's another one came after there. And that requires a couple of techniques. One is called edge grinding, where you actually grind down the edge so there's a little flat platform on the edge. Mm -hmm. And then it, they also probably use what's known as a soft hammer, uh, either a bone or of antler or very hard wood. And that gives you a little greater control over the thinness of the flakes. And they were thinning the artifacts doing that way uh, and producing the Shapes. If you looked at this in profile, the edge is almost perfectly straight. Um, it's not even wavy anymore. So this is a lovely artifact. Uh, I guess I'm not supposed to use the term beautiful. Tony would hurt me, but uh, I, th I think it's a beautiful art artifact. I do too. Um, yeah. um, and sophisticated and and yeah, mm -hmm. skilled. Yeah, and this remember we, we talked about the uh, the, the mask the cleaver. This is the same site. Geshe not your call. Um, in Israel. And this is a sort of classic, almost archetypal hand axe and two views of it. Uh, in fact, the, I, the left view was used on the uh, on a cover of evolutionary anthropology uh, for, for an article that, that I wrote several years ago. Um, and I need to talk a little bit about the shape. Um, it looks like a teardrop. Mm -hmm. uh, the there actually is a mathematical term for it. It's called a hemilemniscate. If you all write that down, you can impress your friends and relatives. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you know, Homo erectus was not thinking in terms of formal geometrics. But this seems to be, if, if we take the, the basic ergonomic driving forces of the hand axe, this seems to be what you get if you refine those ergonomic principles into a ideal shape mm -hmm. yeah. and uh and this is what john this is not, not my idea it's john gowlett's idea but i think it's a very telling idea that um, there was this 
prototypical archetypal shape that hominins were striving for because it gave them pleasure. Mm. That is, when they when they hit the the prototype um, that closely, it's a very impressive. It's impressive to us mm -hmm. when we see it, even though we're not Homo erectus. Very few of us make hand axes. Um, and this brings up a, the, a point that we were talking about a little bit before the show started, which Tony and I started to puzzle about after we'd looked at hundreds and hundreds of hand axes. If you look at the, the site at Geshe Yakov, this is an exceptional artifact. This is what most of the hand axes look like at Geshe Yakov. And there are hundreds of them. It's not like there are one or two. There are a lot of them. And there's only one that looks like that. Hmm. Um, and that's a bit of a puzzle. Um, Tony and I use the term exceptionalism. We probably, probably should have picked a better word, but it's the term we, we settled on. That is, if you look at collections of hand axes from sites, that's what you typically find is scores of hand axes like this Sometimes nothing more than that. Sometimes that's all you get. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes you get a hand axe like this. Um, so I think we're almost, uh, almost to my favorite hand axe in the show. Um, this is a hand axe from a site in South Africa called uh, Katupan, which is a, a fairly well-known site complex there. And when we were at the, the Kimberley, the McGregor Museum in, in Kimberley, um, we looked at 800 hand axes from Katupan, and none of them came even close to this hand axe. So let me talk a little bit about this one because I think this was in the running for the, um, the most impressive hand axe in the exhibition. It's it's pretty big artifact. It's about nine inches long, and it's made out of ironstone. But if you look closely, look closely at the edges yep. here. And here, what you can see is that the stone napper flaked it in such a way that he brought out, or she brought out, the layering in the stone. That is, um, it's a very beautiful layered ironstone. And whoever napped this artifact decided to accentuate that. Um, it, it's a beautiful artifact in terms of bilateral symmetry. But beyond that, I mean, Whoever was really doing it, his material. Yeah, they basically what they were doing is taking a piece of stone and bringing out the beauty in the stone. Um, and to the point where even the dark ridge around the point is symmetrical, right? Exactly. I mean, that is exactly. That is it, skill. It, it's a stunning that artifact. It's one of the few times I wanted to pick up a hand axe and actually walk out. Um, <laughs> But being a good professional, I didn't do that. Actually, it was just sitting on a shelf in, in, in the museum yeah. in, in Kimberley. You see woodworkers layer wood laboriously so that they can shape it and bring out all the different colors right. and layers. It's, right? it's the same the thing. Same my, my, my brother was a woodworker, and that's what he would do. And mm -hmm. that's what this stone napper was doing. They were bringing out from the stone mm -hmm. features that made it uh, a beautiful artifact. Um, or from okay, Tony's so you point can of view, see why they would choose a special piece of stone to put this much over determination in it, this much work and thought in it, right? And that, that's the piece we can't see. We don't know whether the stone napper went out looking for such a piece, or whether having found the piece, saw the potential, and, and then drew out it. the potential. Yeah. Um, I kind of like the second interpretation simply because it's easier. Um, because we can't see how the individual actually selected it. That would be very nice to know. Um, but what, what this, again, what the stone napper is doing is exploiting certain um, perceptual biases that we have towards certain kinds of patterns and certain kinds of colors and certain kinds of shapes. And these things are all part of our perceptual system. But instead of just using them to perceive, the, the makers are using them as a way to produce attractive artifacts. And I'll just show you a few more. Um, the site at Mayan Baruch in, in Israel has this beautiful red 
layered flint that just makes these gorgeous red artifacts. And then they would sometimes have these nice yellow patterns running through them. And same thing, um, most of them are kind of average, but every once in a while they would make these beautiful um, mm -hmm. bilaterally symmetrical artifacts. Um, this is, uh, I think, our first flint artifact, actually. Um, and this is from a, a site in France from the Somme River Terraces. Historically, 200 years ago, well, almost 200 years ago, Bichet de Paris, um, collecting these artifacts was the first person to actually demonstrate that humans had an antiquity going back into the Ice Ages. And so the Somme River Terraces are historically kind of important for us, which is one of the reasons I wanted to include uh, one of these artifacts in the ex exhibition. And you can see again that the same kinds of flaking techniques, you can see this flake has come all the way, almost all the way across that artifact. Um, and whoever was making this was a master stone napper. Um, this actually became the artifact that the Nasher chose to use for all their publicity. Um, interestingly, this is a hand axe known as a big boy from Bidnam in, in England. By English standards, it's a big hand axe. By African standards, it's a medium hand axe. So yeah. um, it has to do with the fact that flint nodules tend not to be very big. Um, Oh, this artifact that looks is, like a bird face, doesn't it? Yeah, this is this is this is an, an interesting one. It's um, uh, from the side of Cuxton in England, and it's known as the Cuxton Giant because it's just about the biggest hand axe you can find in in England, and it's about thirteen inches long. A couple of things about this artifact: it's not just the, the standard teardrop shape; it's an exaggeration of that. It's an elongated exaggeration of the teardrop shape. You still got sort of the glob butt down here, but boy, they exaggerated this forward extension mm -hmm. considerably. Uh, it's a beautiful artifact, but what I want to point out is this right here. You see this, uh, let's see if I can draw it. Yes, interesting plane, isn't it? Yes, that's what's called a flute. And the way that was made is the stone napper at the end hit the tip of the artifact to strip a flake off coming down the side. And a pretty risky move, wasn't it? It's a very risky move because if you do it wrong, you break the whole thing. The whole thing mm -hmm. shatters. So you spend all this time producing this nice artifact. And at the end, you say, hey, I'm hot stuff. Watch, I'm going to do this. So I think one of the things we're seeing is not just visual appeal, we're seeing showing off. That is, some of these overdetermined artifacts are made because the individuals are really showing off their ability and their particular skill. Would that be useful? I mean, are, uh, so many of these you point out do not have signs of wear. Um, and... I guess, I'm guessing it would not be a particularly useful artifact. Yeah. That is, a, that is, yeah, you could use it for something. You could hit your little brother over the head with it. It would probably work really <laughs> nicely for that. But um, as a regular tool, no, it's probably a little bit too awkward. So they invested all this effort, probably for another reason. Yeah. Um, and I'll show you a few more. We had a lot of these. This, this is a hand axe from Niger. It, it has this sort of beautiful patina to it. Um, Tony and I argued a little bit about this one because the patina was not an intended part of the artifact. So part of the beauty of the artifacts, the fact that it sat out on the desert for several hundred thousand years and got this beautiful patina on it. Um, but we included it anyway, why not? This one's from Saudi Arabia. Uh, again, it's a beautiful artifact, uh, and you can see all of the characteristics we talked about before. It's a little asymmetrical, but a lot of hand axes were, and uh, John Gallup thinks the asymmetry was actually intentional because it, it helped the grip, um, and well, we don't have time really to go into it in a lot of detail. I'm sure you were very lucky to hold these in your hands. I'm sure there's. So oh, it's great. And yeah, this, that this is a good meeting. example. Yeah. Um, this is a hand axe from Montague Cave in South Africa. And it's 14 and a half inches long. This is a, an archaeologist named James Cole who's holding it up. So you can get an idea of how big this artifact is. Hmm. Uh, and Montague Cave was actually a manufacturing site. And there are very few complete hand axes because they carried them away. 
but this is one of the few. And this is a good example of an artifact that probably was not a hand tool. I mean, it's too big, it's too heavy. It would be impractical to use. You could use it with two hands maybe, but then you're likely to break the tip off. Mm -hmm. um, so why do it? One of the visual things that we really like, even modern people, is um, exaggeration. Uh, and the neuroaesthetics people call this peak shift. That is, if, it, if you get a particular pattern that gives you pleasure, if you exaggerate the pattern, it gives you more pleasure. That's all it is. It's the kind of thing that um, political cartoonists use all of the time. Um, mm -hmm. You know, making Obama's ears bigger or making... Trump's hair oranger than it actually is. You know, it, it's exaggerating uh, because- <laughs> To make a statement. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you get an effect and that's what's going on here. They're exaggerating these things. And making overly large artifacts turned out to be a cottage industry in some places. Um, mm -hmm. So this is another artifact, um, two, two views of it. This is the view from the catalog uh, on the right, I put a photo of it of somebody actually showing the size of a human hand. This thing weighs almost four kilos, you know, oh, like my. nine pounds. Um, it's a big artifact. Um, it's unlikely to have been an effective hand tool. Somebody's doing this, exaggerating the size to make an impressive artifact for some reason, probably not utilitarian. Um, well, maybe to show off, I'm the maker. If this is a cottage industry, maybe there's a little competition among specialists. Sure. And they're, they're showing and, their and, and, and of like course, that's stuff. that's exactly what a Jared Diamond would have said: is that oh, really? The only thing we're seeing here is standard sexual selection, and mm -hmm. you know, somebody's de demonstrating, "Hey, baby, I've got a big stone tool, uh, and uh, I'm a hot mate." Um, I don't think so. And the reason I don't think so is because these overdetermined forms are actually pretty unusual. Um, if this was a sexual selection system, everybody would be investing in overdetermined form or they'd never get any sex, right? Um, <laughs> and so, you'd, and so you'd, you'd see a lot more of it and we don't. Instead, what we see is a few individuals once in a while investing in this overdetermination of form and what Tony would say is it's a personal expression of their urge to create. That's how Tony usually said it, that it's the result of an urge. Personal to satisfaction, personal testing yeah. of one's skills, right? Exactly. It may have had some collateral effect on how attractive you were to somebody else, but it would have been a secondary, <laughs> not a primary uh, effect. A couple more examples. I'm quite fond of this cleaver. So it's on another giant cleaver. It's you know almost 13 inches long, um, and it has this nice bent symmetry to it. Um, and that happens late in hand axes. This artifact's probably only 300,000 years old. But toward the end, they started not just producing bilateral symmetry. They started messing with the bilateral symmetry. That is, they started to play with it in interesting ways. This is a, another hand axe from Algeria about the same age. Again, a very large hand axe. One of the things about the catalog, and, uh, and Laura and, and Paul have seen this, um, is that almost every image with only a couple of exceptions, the artifacts are life size. Um, Tony mm. insisted that the catalog presents stone tools in sort of life size, because the tendency is to take a picture of a hand axe and condense it to about two inches and it's not very impressive. But when you have a hand axe that takes a two page spread, which is what many of them did in, in the catalog, it becomes a much more uh, impressive image. I can testify to that. Um, and the, uh, this hand axe we decided to put upside down um, just because we have no reason to necessarily think they were always looked at with the butt end down. Mm -hmm. um, so we decided to put one out with the butt end up. And I, th I think the effect was actually kind of interesting. Okay, we need to talk about this one a little bit. Um, this is a very late hand axe from an English side of Grindle Pit. Um, it's probably 300,000 years old at most. This is what's known as a twisted ovate hand axe. 
And this is from the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. Um, and it's made out of flint. And if you look on the image to the left, you can see the stone napper had all of those basic skill techniques we talked about. That is making these nice long flake removals and also made them in parallel. So, so Todd and Christine will be used to that because that kind of flaking pops up in American projectile points a lot for making really beautiful artifacts. But what they did was interesting. They made this artifact look, to, look as if it had been twisted around the pole. And it's called an S-twist because the, la the profile view um, wow. looks like an S. Mm -hmm. um, it's an absolutely beautiful artifact. Again, this is the second one I actually wanted to carry off. Um, but, <laughs> and, and again, they, they appear late. And they're mostly found in English hand axes, but they're not always. There are some twisted profile hand axes from the Middle East. There's some twisted profile hand axes from Ethiopia in obsidian that are probably 800,000 years old. Um, so this idea of playing with form not just imposing form, but manipulating it in interesting ways is, is one that I think uh, we can see pretty clearly in the artifacts. Would there be any utilitarian purpose for that? Would it have assisted in separating two fibrous layers probably of something not. or a skin? That is probably not. No one, no one has ever come up with a utilitarian reason for having uh, an S twist in the profile of a hand axe. Um, so it, it and they're all, they're all very carefully worked. They're all heavily trimmed, um, and they I they were yeah. they they were not just tools. Um, this is a a hand axe from Lewa in in Kenya. Uh, again, probably half a million years old. But in in this case, the photo doesn't quite do it justice. But the but the class, the original stone was this beautiful black, almost blue color. Uh, and the, the napper clearly selected it for that reason and then invested a lot of effort. This is a lava. It's not flint, it's really hard to work. And yet you can see the same kinds of skill involved in producing this hand axe as we're in, in the flint hand axes. Um, this is Joel Shapiro's hand axe. You, some of you may know Joel Shapiro is an American sculptor, is a, a, a friend of Tony's. And uh, Tony gave him this hand axe at, at one point. But I, I really love this hand axe. It's really beautiful. It's a, it's a nice, what we call long lanceolate hand axe. has beautiful flaking patterns. And the stone is just beautiful. Um, Tony always said this is the hand axe he wants buried with him. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. It's clearly his favorite. Uh, and we're, again, back to this idea of selecting a class of raw material because of, the, of what's in the raw material itself. And this napper did a wonderful job of napping what's really a pretty awful kind of stone to flake. It's a mm -hmm. metamorphic kind of rock. It's very hard to work. And yet, clearly, this pattern of large crystals was very attractive. And so they invested the time and effort into producing this artifact. Right. It's the depth of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, we haven't uh, even gotten to figure stones yet. Oh, my God. No, we haven't. I'm going to sprint along so we'll get there. Um, you'll get tired of hand axes if you talk to me long enough. Um, this is another <laughs> shape that, that we occasionally find exaggerated in hand axes. Instead of long and narrow, we get these nice squat, what's called chordate shapes, because it's kind of heart-shaped if you turned it upside down. This is another twisted ovate from Green Heights in England. This is a beautiful artifact. Um, mm. And you can't quite, you can sort of detect the twist. I don't have a profile view of it. But here, this, it's the selection of the raw material that's interesting. This is what's called, um, oh, what's the name? It's called bullet eye flint. Um, and it was used at Swanscom and, and some other sites. And it occasionally had these nice little round, um, sort of like target eyes to them. But this sort of multicolored flint and the napper clearly worked very carefully to uh, produce a, a lovely artifact. Looks like a fish. Yeah. Um, I'll try to run through these. Um, the site at Box Grove is very interesting archaeologically. It's probably one of the most significant archaeological sites in the world. It's about 500,000 years old. 
um, it's on the southern coast of Britain. Uh, and about 500,000 years ago, the, the sea level dropped briefly for about 100 years. And a bunch of hominins moved out onto the landscape and lived there, probably Homo heidelbergensis. Um, and then the sea level rose and sealed that landscape hmm. so that what we have at Box Grove is a flash in time. We'll almost never get that in, in the Paleolithic, where we have the remains of stone tools produced probably by a single social group over the course of a couple of generations. Um, very unusual for, for the time period I work in. But what we find there is almost a cookie cutter approach to hand axes. There are almost 500 hand axes from Box Grove, and they all look like this, hmm. almost every one. Um, and they're about the same size. They're made of this beautiful gray flint. Um, this is a different set, another set, and a third. Now, you may say, what is this hand axes by Napper A? What Tony thought when we first saw them, and I think 2014, uh, 2000, no, actually, it was 2013. Um, They're is, so similar. He, yeah. He thought he could detect individual artisans mm -hmm. based on stylistic features of the hand axes. And that rang a bell because I had talked that to a, an archaeologist named um, Natalie Uomini, who is now at Max Planck in, in Germany. And she thought she could do the same thing at Box Grove, looking at technical aspects, not just style, but technical aspects. Mm -hmm. So, we came back in 2015 and got Natalie to come and uh, an ar English archaeologist named Freddie Foulds who'd written about individual artisans in, in the Stone Age. And Tony invited his friend uh, Richard Deacon, who's a, an English sculptor. And so Tony and Richard went through the assemblage and tried to identify groups of hand axes made by the same individual. And Natalie and Freddie went through the same independently and tried to identify groups made by the same individual. And they and, and identified in several cases, the same groups of artifacts. And wouldn't and, that make sense in a social group that you would be known for your hand axes, that people would be able to pick out, this was made by this yes, artisan it, it, over it, here, it, and maybe it it's more valuable, and maybe it's yeah. a collector item amongst themselves. I mean, they were trading amongst them. Selves, I'm sure trade goes back. So, I mean, it would, so, so this this so napper, sense. napper B, who I'm calling napper B, had this little thing that he or she did at the end. Remember that flute from the Cuxton mm -hmm. Giant? Mm -hmm. um, there's a related technique called tranche, where you strike the edge mm -hmm. and strip a flake off at the end. Um, and all these hand axes have the same approach to making tranches. Right. So. So that's 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 a technical piece. But Tony and Richard identified these together also, and they didn't know what a tranche was from a loaf of bread. So um, they were responding more to the overall impact of the artifact than to any of the technical indices that we use. Yeah. So interestingly, I think you know we were able to identify what may be the the earliest identified artisans. Um, and we exhibited them in, in the exhibition that way. And interestingly, it got probably more response than anything else about the exhibition was the idea that we thought we could identify individual artisans in the past. It brings them so much more forward. To it, it really does bring, bring them home. Yeah. This is a fairly famous hand axe. It's the West Toft hand axe. And you can see it's got a shell in the middle. And we've already talked about this a little bit. The, the, the hand axe makers not only tried to make nice forms occasionally, they also used the hand axes to show other things off. And one of the things they did with shells, there's shells are a little bit unusual, but um, we did find other examples of it. But the thing we found most often were holes. That's for some reason, they would like to make hand axes with holes all the way through. And this is a really tricky bit for stone napping because you really have to be very careful or you break the artifact. We saw lots of broken artifacts, individuals uh, trying to make holes, but breaking the bridge between them. Hmm. Right. So that this is oh, a good example. Yeah. Somebody had to be very careful <laughs> yes. yeah. without breaking that artifact. And again, they're far more common than I thought they would be. Mm -hmm. And it, 
by the way, you don't want to put your thumb, somebody says, well, it's just for holding the thumb. That's a good way to break your thumb. No, you don't want to do that. Um, so it, it's, how, not, it's not for gripping. Yeah. It's for something else. Well, think how symbolic the circle is, how meaningful it is. Right? That's def definitely well, a such a symbol. universal symbol. Yeah. Uh, and then we're back to faces. Um, we've shown some faces that, before, but um, more hand axes than I expected have faces. <laughs> Expressive faces. Yeah, this, yeah, this one is, you know, not sure I want to meet him on a dark night. So, <laughs> okay, and now, now I have to, to have to talk about the one set of artifacts that Tony and I simply could not agree on. We argued endlessly about it. Um, <laughs> And uh, he's wrong and I'm right. And I'm the one who's given the talk. So uh, there we go. But uh, Tony saw these as elephant heads. That is, he looked at these artifacts and said, well, that's an elephant head. And I said, no, it isn't, it's pick. Um, because it's a classic pick. I mean, basically it's a triangular cross section core tool. It's a fairly well-known tool type in African um, Paleolithic studies, and these are wonderful picks. But Tony sees, saw them and saw them as elephant heads. So we eventually just agreed to call them elephant head picks. Um, I don't think their resemblance to elephant heads I find to be just completely accidental. Tony thought it was intentional. We didn't resolve it. We didn't get come to blows. Um, uh, <laughs> no blood was no, I, they're, they're nice artifacts, uh, but I don't think they're elephants. Ah, but then we come to these. Um, okay, yeah. Um, probably the most controversial artifacts in the exhibition. Um, Tony and I were in a uh, museum in France um, uh, near Les Aisies. It, it was a private archaeological museum. Mm -hmm. And we were going through some collections uh, that the museum had that were stored in, in an attic. And we ran across these hand axes and they looked really kind of funny. I looked at them first and I yeah, that's the world's weirdest cleaver. You know, I don't know what the hell's going on with that. And then it's one of these things that it's kind of like, um, like a gestalt. Once something pops into your mind, it doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. Suddenly it looked like a horse. That, that is- eye protruding, yeah. Yeah, so I looked and went, I think I said some four letter words said, Tony, it's a horse. And he looked at it and he said, you're right. And then we found this other one, it looked like it too. And then we found another one, which God well, knows what that is. If you go back, was that a natural nodule on that face that they sent? No, the no, well, actually I can reconstruct the whole thing to you because uh, I've looked at it very carefully. It's, yeah. no, it was not a natural form. Basically this started off as a large core Mm -hmm. And they use a, a special technique known as Tashengi technique to knock off a very large flake from this core. That was the first step. And this edge along the top, the straight That's edge, what I'm asking, if that um, was a natural Is a result of that initial flake removal. That is when they <laughs> knock the flake off, off of the core, that straight edge was there. Yeah, um, that's what I'm And thinking. then they modified it from there. And you can see by the nature of the flakes, that they're not trying to make these nice long flakes that mm -hmm. thin out the artifact. Mm -hmm. They're these short ones. And what they're doing is pulling in the neck. Right. Um, yeah. And so they're purposefully the taking artifact. something that had the nose of a horse, the eye of a horse, and then cutting away to showcase and make it. It could be that's what they horse. saw. They saw the top line as having potential. Mm -hmm. And then they modified the rest of the artifact yeah. to do that. I think there's a very good chance that that was the case. Yeah. Now, I should say, to, to, be, to be honest, I show this to my colleagues. And about half of them think I'm out of my effing mind. <laughs> that is, they do not see anything vaguely animal-like in these artifacts. And the others say, yeah, I think you're right. Good luck publishing it. Um, well, I did get it published, but, uh, but it took a while. I, I remember I... One rejection we got from, um, I guess it was the proceedings of the National Academy of Science, the archaeologist said, it's a surface find, and it is a surface find. So we can't count surface finds. Um, uh, if it had been buried, it would be okay. And I'm thinking, we're in the Sahara Desert. I mean, <laughs> basically, if, if you wait another 50,000 years, a sand dune next to it would have blown over the top of it. Then it would be a good example. Exactly. Um, 
Um, uh, um, so it's from a very remote locale in southwestern uh, Algeria called uh, Ben uh, yeah. And it actually was found by a, a French army officer back in 1980. You can ask the question, what was a French army officer doing out in Algeria in 1980? That's another question. Um, I don't have an answer to it. But the fact um, that there's so many but, of them and they all look alike, like somebody had sought out that feature and yeah. then napped it consistently. Exactly. No. That, that the it, it repetition just of the, it has to count. Yeah, the other problem with these is there's no other site in the world that I know of that has things like this. But yeah. it's a very yeah. late site. It's probably, may even be less than 300,000 years old. Um, yeah. Late and, according to your time scale. <laughs> right. And yeah. so what, what seems to be happening at this point is they're not just producing nice forms. They're beginning to do something else with them. And in this case, they're imposing a specific kind of shape mm -hmm. that is an iconic representation of an animal. And that is a big change in an evolutionary sense in terms of what these hand axes are doing. And then two weeks later, they quit and stopped making hand axes entirely. Um, I'm, wow. I'm being, I'm joking. This but this is really the end, the end of the show for hand axes. Wow, wow. I just, oh, yeah. I just mentioned, Tom, that, you know, quite a few people have made comments and questions in the chat room. I will hold off. I want to get through the slides and then we can ha introduce those questions and we comments. We got lots of questions. Yeah. 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 Lots of discuss, okay. lots of implications here. Yeah. So about the same time age as the, the, the hand axes I just showed you, there's a famous old artifact called the Barakat Ram figurine, which was found by um, Namagor and Inbar at a site on the Golan Heights. Um, it's about 230,000 years old. Look at the size. It's only one inch long. Um, if, you, if you go to uh, Jerusalem, you can go to the National Museum. It's on display in the National Museum. It's on a little turntable. It's a tiny artifact. It's made out of pumice, but it's a modified artifact. That is, somebody carved this thing. And again, some people see a female figure in it. Other people see doodling, um, but it's about the same age. So well, 300,000, 230,000. Yeah, once you see the female figure, you cannot unsee it. Yeah. Um, so the, the idea of imposing not just nice geometric shapes, but natural forms on artifacts mm -hmm. uh, do appear this old, uh, just not on hand axes themselves. Right. I'm going to shift through these. Tony was very fond of these. These are, these are artifacts from Egypt in which people would find a natural clasp with a shape in it. Like in this case, it has a natural circle. And then take away the extra And they take framing. away and isolate it. Yeah. It's a good, it's another example of framing. Again, we have a nice circle in here. That's a natural circle, but the, the flake reveals it. And there's some others here. Oh, Tony loved this because it's wonderfully phallic. Um, <laughs> Yeah. I don't, he was very fond of this, and I won't go into detail. Um, but you can see, I don't think I need to explain that to you. Um, this one, interestingly, there seems to be an animal inside it's this. A horse inside. Yeah. 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 Wow. Hmm. And again, natural shapes, you know, you could think it's a navel or whatever. Okay. A few words about Neanderthals. Um, Neanderthals made hand axes, but. I don't think they were lineal descendants of the earlier hand axes. Neanderthals started to make them for another reason. Hmm. Um, and they usually use this wonderful triangular form. They're beautiful hand axes, but they're not holdovers from an earlier age. Neanderthals were doing it for a different reason. They're you probably very use. functional tools for some reason. Function. They probably were not hafted. Some Neanderthal tools were hafted. These were probably not. Hmm. Um, and some of them were made by beautiful raw material, this jasper from Font Moore, and you'll be seeing a lot of artifacts from Font Moore. Okay, figure stones. Are we ready for figure stones? Sure. <laughs> okay. Yes. yes, oh my God. Um, oh. The first disagreement Tony and I had was almost the first day when I walked in. It's like a bird head. And yeah. Tony had a whole shelf with this kind of artifact on. And the way I had been trained um, is to discount this kind of thing as being folly. That's how I was trained professionally. And when later we were chatting and 
with Jeremy Strick, who was there, and Tony says, well, you know, I, I think we, we agree on everything. I said, well, we agree on everything except the figure stones. I'm not so sure I agree about, with, about the figure stones. Uh, and so we had a back and forth about that. Um, but I eventually came around to his point of view partially, I, I should say that. Tony sees figure stones everywhere. I only see them in certain circumstances. Um, if it looks as if it comes from a good archaeological context, and we can actually associate the things with a particular prehistoric industry, then I'm comfortable. Or with if it's been modified to accentuate things. a feature. And, and especially if they're modified, yes, very good, especially if they're modified. I mean, part of the problem is if you, in my business, I'm sure Chris and, and Todd have run about this, run into this before, is people in the community love to call and say, I was out on a walk and I found this fascinating um, historic artwork and I want you to come see it. And they bring it in and it's, it's a provocative pebble. You know? um, without any context, you, there's nothing you can do of it. Um, but if you know that it comes from a prehistoric site, um, and especially if it's modified, then uh, you can suspend your disbelief, which is pretty much what I did. And, and the site is fought more. Um, and as a site in France, it's actually been excavated once, uh, and it's a quarry site. And it was used by Neanderthals to get this really beautiful jasper, which comes in lots of colors, mostly yellows, sometimes reds. Uh, and, and it's really terrible raw material if you want to make a stone tool out of it, because it's, it, it has fracture planes in it, and it falls apart in interesting ways. Um, and because it falls apart in interesting ways, you get lots of interesting shapes. And some of the shapes look like things. And Neanderthals occasionally took advantage of these things. Um, and some of these things are really a lot of fun. I think some of them really are legitimate. Um, so don't think I'm, I'm sort of poo-pooing them all. Um, though we did visit a guy in the Netherlands who had a house full of these little jasper flakes. And all of them, were, he had them divided into species, into to what kinds of animals they were. <laughs> wow. um, I just sipped my coffee. Um, archaeologists can be pretty boring, but there are some really, from far more, there really are some, some artifacts that I think are pretty clearly figure stones that, um, that Neanderthal did trim to accentuate the shapes of one of them. And I really like this gnarly dude. Um, I don't think anyone would look at this and not see a face. Um, I mean, it's that Neanderthals identified the face, I don't think is, is remarkable. And this, this is maybe my favorite of them. It's a very large artifact. You know, it's, it's oh, I can see why. Yeah. Um, and this one clearly has been modified. That is, somebody trimmed off the top. Somebody trimmed around this side. So somebody did modify this artifact um, to bring out the facial characteristics. And this, this is oh, a good look at this one. How mm -hmm. could you say no to this? Yeah, it, Tony referred to this as WC Fields. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you, and now yeah, I can't look at it and not think of WC Fields. Yeah. Um, and again, it's been trimmed a little bit, it's trimmed, trimmed along this side trimmed a little bit at the top. Anybody who would pick, and also it looks like somebody's really sort of pecked out the mouth so it was a little bigger than it was uh, uh, initially. Yeah. And this just looks like a helmet. Um, you know, this one is not modified, um, but th this is a big one. It's 21 in inches tall. It, it still sits on Tony's patio. Uh, and. Wow. Uh, and he sees it as, as being a three-dimensional human with a you know, very tiny head with arms. Mm -hmm. And he thinks it looks a lot like this one, which is a uh, Dr. Paleolithic, the Swabian E from, from yeah. Hollefels in, in Germany. But I think that the main point is that this is, this is a completely modified object. This is not, um, it's just modified a little bit. But Tony thinks they're responding to the, the, the same basic urge. I can see that. Yeah. Um, oh, and I, I like this one. This. Um, this one is mostly a natural object. Like somebody did add the eye, mm -hmm. um, and it's just a. You know, well, it's a when we were in the caves of France, you would see a lot of ropey 
um, striations on the cave walls that looked just oh, like yeah. a mammoth with an eye at it became a mammoth. Right? So uh, Tony and I went went to Neo when we were down in southern France, which is one of the few painted caves you can still go into, and. Tony didn't pay any attention to the painted images. He was just staring at the ceiling because the ceiling had all of these evocative shapes <laughs> in it. And he was just fascinated with the evocative shapes. I was yeah. fascinated with it. By Nature's the art. Yeah. yeah. And it seems to be more meaningful when you see an emergent mammoth from the cave wall that is already there, right? It's nature. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a it's very powerful um, experience, force even coming. for us today. Um, I mean, the the whole act of that Neo, you have to walk almost a kilometer underground to, to get to the paintings. And this whole transition sort of makes them even more remote and more Mysterious. impactful when you get there. Um, and, but of course the, the cave paintings are all relatively recent. They're all more recent than any of these things that we're talking about. But what Tony thinks is it, it's responding to the same kind of impulse. It's deep, hardwired in us. Yeah. Um, and this well, actually comes this from, a from a deeper one. side. This is one of my favorites. You know, this, is, this is actually fairly famous. And that's actually a piece of bone in there yeah. that sort of passed underneath the uh, the nose for the eyes. And this is pretty clearly a Neanderthal artifact. I don't that's think anyone so knows that. Yeah. yeah. Interestingly, um, I mentioned Boucher de Paris uh, as the French archaeologist who sort of established human antiquity in the Ice Age, he was also interested in figure stones. And he collected hundreds of these things. And they have a lot of them at the National Museum of Archaeology in Saint-Germain. So we decided to include some of them in the exhibition. And so there, these are three. And this is a fourth. And these were, again, initially collected by uh, Bichard de Paris. This is a Mesolithic figure stone that's probably only about 14,000 years old. And we put it in the exhibition to demonstrate that figure stones are actually something that our people have been doing for a long time. Mm -hmm. And it's not unusual. The only thing unusual about the figure stones we show is the antiquity. That it's is, they're the older than others. It is, is the age of them. And this is a historic one from, from Alaska. It, it's, was well, an Inuit artifact. And it's essentially the same kind of thing that the far more artifacts um, that were Neanderthal in age and probably doing the same kind of job. Okay, so I've been rambling on and on and that was the end of the exhibition. So maybe I should just keep that them up if gorgeous. anybody wants to go back to a particular image. So. Well, I, I would, the very first one you showed, I had an observation of the symmetry of a hand axe that looked really like an abstract face, one of the very first ones you showed. And I was thinking yeah, how- Which one that was? Oh, it, um, just one of the very, very first ones. So the, well, I guess my point is that- Whoops. We are bilateral symmetrical beings. Right. Our faces are bilaterally symmetrical. And the fact that to shape a figure, to shape a hand axe with its ergonomic necessities, to make it useful, to make it a good weight in the hand, to take away its excess weight, you end up with something that is bilaterally symmetrical. So in a sense, I'm not saying it was an intellectual leap for these, um, these beings, for, for the, see, the next one, I think. But it just see this one. The, see the face? It seems almost as though it's self-referential. The force oh, of nature would love you. that would shape um, us and our physical vehicles and the forces that would shape uh, the decisions to make a hand axe that's ergonomic. It just seems a little self-referential. It just seems that the same forces of nature at work on us designing us are also useful to design a tool. I just thought it was so beautiful to see the workings of nature through and through. Not that there's an intellectual 
leap by Homo erectus and Neanderthal, no, I, I, but I, that I, I it's emergent your... in us. Right. It's just it just boggles the mind. It just right. makes and the world complete. I don't know. It's beautiful. Uh, Tony would would agree with you completely. Um, I mean, when Tony saw this artifact, he saw the face immediately. That's the first thing yeah. that he saw. Uh, right. And but I kind of like the other part of your your observation that it has a lot to do with human bodies and human grip that is the the ergonomic engagement with this artifact that is making it in in the first place is influenced by the fact that we are bilaterally symmetrical creatures yeah. and that our interaction with the stone is going to reflect that to some degree without any passage through there's some sort of brilliant insight. It's something that our bodies are doing and in terms of imposing the form on the artifact. And I think that's the, the point that John Gallant would make is that this is yeah. largely an, an embodied kind of cognition and as opposed to a reflective intellectual kind of cognition. Yeah, the same nature uses those same principles in its design whether it's a physiological being or the physiological being needs those same principles to shape its tools. It's just a, yeah. a beautiful carry through. We have so many questions from the audience. Why, um, we get, yeah, this is thank so... you for the slideshow. It was like attending the Nasser <laughs> exhibition with narration. It was even better. Right. Yeah. Um, so thank you. Everything you've ever wanted to know about. Yes, it was beautiful. I mean, <laughs> just what axis. you can decode, what you just can kidding. deduce yeah. from it, the insights that are right there in plain sight if you know how to read the book. For most but of if us, you can turn it off, well, I want to um, also give our yeah, audience a chance to, to participate. To guess, talk. Yeah. I was going to say, for most of us, this is new information. Oh, this totally is This new. is data and things that go way beyond anything we've ever been told this before. This is self reflection for us yeah. to see this yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, to, and, and to how appreciate our ancestors and as you point out the, the what the 20,000 generations from them to us and this whole lineage yeah. we need to reach back and and appreciate those ancestors right mm. because this is our family tree uh, and so Tom so, we're gonna take down the slideshow now good that sounds fun yeah thank you and um, so many good questions have been posed um, mm. so Let's go to Tony. I want to hear from no. James Herod. I want okay. to uh, hear from... Tony Hall is up first. Tony, uh, go ahead and... Uh... Yeah. Oh, yeah Tom, 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 thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. A splendid uh, talk. Uh, things I'd never imagined before. Really interesting. Yeah. Uh, I have a, a couple of questions, something I didn't really hear. And what is the variety of uses of these hand axes? Uh, they they appear to have been mostly a multi-purpose tool. Okay. They their initial primary use appears to have been in large animal butchery. Okay. As about the time we start seeing them in the archaeological record, about 1.8 million years ago, the hominins started to butcher fairly large animals as opposed to the smaller ones that they were doing before. And so they needed a heavy, large cutting tool. So initially, that's the thing we know they were doing. But they were probably doing other things with it as well, because they made them for a million and a half years over Africa, Middle East, Europe. I mean, it had to have done a lot of things, at least mediocre, um, for them to continue to do that. Yes. The other thing they do is they can act as a core. That is, if you're carrying just that artifact around and you need a sharp flake, you can knock a piece off of it. You've got the sharp flake, you can use it. So it's the relationship between the hominids and the tools was a little bit different from ours. And at least I think it, I think it was. And so we're thinking of it, you know, like a, a claw hammer or something, like it has a primary function, probably didn't, um, probably did a lot of things and was just the major focus of the technology because of that. Has anybody uh, made a duplicate of one of these using lithic methods? and seeing how it cuts bones, how it cuts oh, yes. and things like that. Archaeologists love that kind of thing. Well, I know they, they do. Take a hand the... axe and see what we can do with it. Uh, and there's the famous a study. It's field of I... experimental archaeology, too. Right, right. right. And what the, one study that I remember in, in particular by an, Annie Machen in, in England, tried to demonstrate that symmetrical hand axes were 
better at butchering animals than non-symmetrical hand axes. And she hired actual butchers from some <laughs> in English industry and had them butcher you know, fallow deer using hand axes. And it turns out that they're quite effective for butchering animals. And the symmetrical ones are no better than the ugly ones. Interesting. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And, and just a quick comment, um, in terms of, of roundness, uh, I think uh, Jean had a good comment, the cobbles tend toward round or elliptical uh, just by rolling down a river. But I'll also say the, the, it's well known that if you rub a rock that's kind of convex against one that's kind of concave, you will end up with a sphere. This, right. is, this has happened and this, well this, this for is a the, long, long time. This is the the explanation that most archaeologists have for, for the spheroids is that they were bashing tools and that they were used for, you know, bashing roots or bashing plants. And after using them for long enough, they just naturally assumed a round form. So, yes, that's that, that's a, a one of the hypotheses for spheroids. But if you think about the first one I showed you, which is the big one from Ubedia, that's about eight inches in diameter doesn't appear to have been used. And yet somebody had gone to a good deal of trouble to knock pieces off of it so that it ended up round. So there are some artifacts that don't quite fit that explanation. And those are the reasons I finally started to think a little more carefully about it in terms of what was going on. And uh, again, I think it's mostly a matter of spherical shapes being pleasurable and producing physical shapes gives pleasure uh, and that's the major issue so, and it doesn't and, have to be a mutually just, exclusive some, um, yeah. and on the visual yes. side i'll say that some of us like tools of a period when people made things with hands this is a couple <laughs> hundred years old yeah. so uh, i'm one of those people so i appreciate the visual and artistic element too thank you so what would be nice is if uh, we could sit around a table i could hand the hand axes around um, you know, if, if you've held one, you get a little bit different insight into them than just listening to me talk. Um, just to hold something yeah. that somebody shaped a million years ago has to be a, a spiritual experience. Yeah, well, That's all I can yeah. say. And James, yeah. we'll someday maybe ha come come to the Institute and we'll all sit around the table and do just that. We'll share. Tom, yeah. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, I was Tony. reading two names at once on the screen. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, thank uh, you. James you, Herod is an upcoming guest um, Yeah, when he's back in Maine. Hi, James. And I know this is something you have studied very thoroughly, so appreciate hearing your thoughts and comments and questions. Um, and uh, I just want to say that it was a, a wonderful slideshow. The exhibit at the museum was fantastic, and I think it's a major uh, breakthrough for the world of archaeology and anthropology. Me too. Thank you. Me too. Because figure stones were, uh, when Butcher de Paris started finding them, he was condemned, and the French uh, archaeological establishment met as a commission and said that uh, it would be no longer discussed in French archaeology. And so that one. Sort of uh, like language evolution. We'll just declare that we're not going to do it anymore. So. <laughs> uh, and so uh, uh, we, I, I've been working on figure stones for a long time, and, uh, and I come from a, primarily from comparative mythology, but with training in archaeology, paleoanthropology. Um, so I had no problem with the horses, uh, with the elephants. Uh, elephants. I said, and what I did see was on the uh, the wonderful uh, way that the box grove nappers are distinguished uh, to individual nappers of hand axes that the, that the box grove a napper if you look at your slide on the right side uh, the three three images uh, the center and right they have in my view also uh, mammoth heads and trunks on them oh cool wow. uh, ah, okay and this is what i'm working with i've been working for several years uh, on uh, clovis and I was really stunned to see that you had from England that diagonal overshot flaking right. on that tool because that's distinctive for Clovis. And what uh, I realized looking at hundreds and hundreds of Clovis tools is that the diagonal flaking 
is a affordance for zoomorphic figurations down the sides. Okay. Of the okay. And so to see it in England, that diagonal plate came in, to see also that they at Boxgrove, I believe they were making mammoth sculptures on the side. And that's that's at Anzic. That's what I'm working on now at the Anzic Clovis site. Okay. And uh, dozens of uh, proboscid sculptures. The site itself of Anzic is a plateau with that uh, coming from the north is the shape of a proboscid head. It's okay. a mammoth head on the cliff face. Uh, yeah. So I, I love the presentation. It was fantastic. And thank I you. learned a lot. And thank you, Tom, for being working on it. And I see you as an ally. Good. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you James. James, for joining yeah. in. Absolutely. Appreciate that. I'm going to look forward to Clovis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Shoshana, you're up next. Here we go. Fascinating, wonderful talk. And um, as I've mentioned before, I'm a real follower of um, Ellen DeSanayaki, who wrote a lot about art and artification, making um, special and aesthetics and all of that. But I just wanted to show you this because yeah. while I'm doing this, I wanted to ask whether or not um, in the exhibit or in the book, um, do you have pictures of people holding or um, making these these tools? In, in the exhibition, um, we had a, a video of somebody making a hand axe. And we also had uh, three or four hand axes out on a table that people were able wonderful, to pick from. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, maybe yeah. really embody, you know, get them. Yeah. That's it. Picking one up is very important. There's, That's yeah, my, there's the my image. comment about yeah. the human brain, how the human mind works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Indeed, so cool. indeed. That's Shoshana. why it's so ubiquitous, the happy face. Right, right, right. Yeah, right. Exactly. Wonderful insight. Thank yeah. you for that. Yeah. I appreciate it. Uh, we got David Hicks coming up next. Hey, David. And I know that you too read How to Think Like a Neanderthal. Yeah, I did. It was very funny and uh, very educational. It's was, it was really Thank good. Yeah. So. Anyway, uh, I have a couple burning questions. Uh, this came out. Oh. Anyway, uh, the origin of consciousness, uh, the breakdown of the bicameral mind that probably came out when you were in graduate school. And I'm hoping you're the right person to ask this. Is 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 are his theories of you know, Julian James still considered? The, the original bicameral mind argument, no. Um, it's, it's not held in, in detail by anyone that I know in cognitive science, uh, but, but the idea that there are semi-independent neural systems governing different kinds of human experience, I, I think is, is very much the mode in which we think about the brain now. Um, it's just that these, these neural networks are not anatomically isolatable quite to the degree that the original bicameral line thought that they were. But for example, for a different talk at, at a different time, but the, the way we use tools, um, wield them, manipulate them, use them, is, is governed largely by a cognitive system that is largely independent from language. Uh, and uh, it, it's learned differently. It's learned by apprenticeship. It's learned by practice. And yet it's a very important cognitive system. And we can talk about it as if it's a sort of independent entity different from, from linguistic discussion. Um, so yes, I think in that sense, the, the idea that there are sort of separate, not necessarily competing, but um, that the, the mind is not a coherent whole, that it consists of pieces. And the, we can look at the pieces separately, we can look at how they integrate. But so to that degree, I think the idea still is banging around. But what I really appreciated in your book was just the realization of the distinction of capability between Homo sapiens sapiens and the Neanderthal. Um, and there's been a lot of books coming out lately on the potential development of sapiens sapiens through the use of um, mushrooms or some sort of chemical and beer 
and that sort of thing. I don't know if you're up on that, and if you have. I haven't read a lot of it, um, but I what I would say as soon as people got a hold of anything that was mood altering, hallucinogenic, one way or another, they would use it. Um, and pretty much wherever in the world it's available, people use it. Um, and it probably goes way back. Um, and I mean, as, as you may know, uh, David Lewis Williams has made this argument for, for art and um, altered states of consciousness, which is right. a, one of the leading hypotheses still today for why people do these things. And I think it probably stretches back deep into the Stone Age. I don't recognize it in any way on the hand axis, but I'm not sure how I would, um, but I wouldn't discount it out of hand. Okay. That was all my burning questions. Thank you. Okay. We can't hear you, Paul. Go to Fred Smith next. Here we are. Oh, uh, thank you. I, I I know that we're running over. Uh, just a second. I I know that we're running overtime, and I'm sorry. I, I had to miss almost half of your talk and forty percent of it because another <laughs> commitment. But I just have a quick question because we're running over time, and that's <clears throat> um, if you had to recommend one book that could lead a person, you know, I'm educated and so on um into <clears throat> a better understanding of cognitive development physical requirements and spatial uh recognition um and how that traversed through well, the well, one book is tough i mean i, you know, I hate to yeah i would take to okay let's a couple my own horn but uh, the Rise of Homo Sapiens, which is a book that Fred Coolidge and I wrote. The second edition oh, okay. is 2018. Right. Um, I was going to recommend that too, as soon as Fred asked. Sorry, I just chimed in. It's such a good book. Okay, I'll be quiet. Oh, cool. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Chris. The Rise of Homo Sapiens. All right. Um, by yourself and, and, and Coolidge? And Fred Coolidge. Yeah. Let's Fred put Coolidge. Chris and Tom okay. on as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we have another square to fill. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Yeah. So what else, friend? It's okay. If uh, you're okay with running a little over time, Tom, so are we. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, Fred, follow okay. up. Yeah. Okay. That was All right. It's just so, such a great book. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Do you, right. Have you I'm met um, Fred already, Tom? No, I haven't met. I met. I haven't met him. I'm happy to yeah. meet him. Yeah. Because um. <laughs> Fred's retired. He was once the chair of a religion department, and he's a Vedic okay. scholar, and he's very well knowledge. And he's written a few books on my um, desk that are about this <laughs> big. Um, yeah, he's very prolific too, and writes big books. Yeah, yeah, I, was, I, was actually, I was actually. I tend to write program. skinny books, so the, the little <laughs> orange book is a very skinny book. Well, I mean, I, well, I mastered, I mastered the of art of writing the philological footnote a long time ago. So that's why my books seem to be have a lot more in it than there might be. <laughs> so, no, I was, I was the chair of the Department of Asian and Slavic Languages okay. at the University of Iowa for many years and in the religious studies department there also. Yeah. 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 And, and an advisor to our to our institute. So. And you and you are, you actually referenced the uh, hand axe from India earlier, Tom. I did. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so that's something, Fred, that you're familiar with. So yeah. thank you, Fred. I appreciate right. it. Okay, I will. Unless you have something else, we were waiting. <laughs> um, how far is Colorado Springs to um, Santa Fe if you were to drive? Six hours. Six hours. Well, hey, maybe. That's six hours by buggy. You can get there in <laughs> five hours. <laughs> I, I was going to say, it depends on if you speed or not. <laughs> well, maybe we could all rendezvous and you could bring some of your hand axes sometime. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that, that would be fun. fun. Yeah. Yeah. Would be we fun. Would, yeah. we would be a pleasure, a privilege, mm -hmm. I'm sure, yeah. to do that. Absolutely. So we had um, Bruce Bradley nap right. for two hours and tell us blow by blow what he was doing, the decisions, how the Clovis, and this was much, much later, of course, than what you were showing us, but how they had a convention and they followed it and um, yeah. how he said that the most beautiful, um, huge 
elaborate, precious stone ones he felt were intentionally broken, ritually, as a sacrifice, as an offering, and he was quite puzzled by that. Okay. And I thought I would, I would get your comments on that. His um, wife, Cindy Bradley, they also took us on a tour of uh, Crow Canyon and right, excavations right, right. they made. Mm -hmm. But it was just uh, beautiful to hear Cindy, who's um, a cultural anthropologist as well, talk about how, in her opinion, in the cultures much, much later she studied, that they kept through cultural identity, through honoring the ancestors, through maintaining their wisdom traditions, they didn't veer off and innovate as they could have, as they could have, should have, unless pressures were disrupting the culture anyway, but that it, it was tradition that they maintained. Um, and so I wanted to know how much that kind of thinking, in your opinion, might have went into maintaining the, the traditions. And I, how much I think the I, value of the very special pieces yeah. were, were any intentionally broken? Were they sacrificed? Were they in a special place in the cache? Okay, that, that's three questions. I'll try to answer them all. Laura, I'll no. okay. <laughs> first, first, I think there is something about hand axes that goes beyond what we would call tradition. There, there's some kind of lock mm -hmm. on, um, on this form, this prototypical form that just held human attention for a million and a half years. And that suggests there's, there's something quite different going on in a cognitive sense. There was virtually no innovation for a million and a half years. And the innovations that did occur accrued very slowly and were probably not the result of an intentional attempt to solve a problem, but were probably accidents that got incorporated uh, very slowly into the technologies. Like it's not in selection because they helped for some way. Well, no, I think they made hand axes because that was the tool. That's it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea that there were other things um, in some of the sense didn't didn't occur to them. But starting about half a million years ago, things do start to change. Yeah. So that that's one thing. The other is that if we go back to those box grove hand axes, the ones that sort of look like they're cookie cutters, um, other social groups at the same time made slightly different shapes so that the hand axes could be not just marks of individual skill. They could have been community marks. That is, somebody could have told what community you grew up in because oh. of the way you manufacture a hand axe. And that, and that doesn't really appear until about half a million years ago. And this isn't my argument, it's Kerry Shipton's argument. So I don't, don't want you to think I, I thought that one up, but he does a very good job <laughs> with the English hand axes, suggesting that the variations in shape were in fact the result of different community traditions about what the appropriate shape was. Uh, and we and, wouldn't have seen how that would have worked in the materials that were softer, that disintegrated. If you do it there, you would have done it in many of your materials correct, and your specific correct. artifacts because that happens today you have certain insignia that shows and lineage was very important to these people mm. i'm from this tribe i'm from this clan right mm. i'm part of this but a, a lot of a lot of what you do that tells people who you are you don't do intentionally mm. so it, it's what um sometimes called isochristic style. That is just the way you make something, not intentionally. You make it that way, you always make it that way, and somebody over the hill can use that to tell it's you. Um, yeah. and, and, and that gets going about 500,000 years ago. And it, then the final question you had is, did they intentionally destroy any of these? It's a very interesting question. Not that I know of. That is, I can't think of an example of intentionally broken hand axes. We do find broken hand axes, mm -hmm. um, but it turns out they're really tough customers. It turns out it's kind of hard to break one. Yeah, I mean, you need um, a hand axe to break a hand axe, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's one of the reasons we love them because they've been sitting around for a million and a half years and they're still there. Yeah. Um, so um, in theory, we might find circumstances in which we could recognize that, but I can't think of an example. Yeah. Or the beautiful ones that you think were elevated to art, were they showcased, were they ritualized, were they yeah. in ceremony? We don't Do you know find indications that, yeah. that they were? There, there's a funny that. thing about hand axes that 
we don't really understand is once in a while we find sites in which there are hundreds and thousands of hand axes and nothing else. Mm. Um, and the cottage industry, you're saying. It, well, the, the, the thinking is that there was something social going on at that particular spot and hand axes were playing a role. Um, but beyond that, we can't say much. Well, and if there was no language back with Homo erectus or, or Neanderthal to the way that we use language, how was this very specialized skill set conveyed? Just by imitation or maybe I think it would, well, masters I think, showing all the students in a workshop setting where hundreds, you know, yeah. here's Stone Napping School 101, here's the university for it, and you would find so many artifacts. Yes, yeah, so the, the answer is almost precisely that. I mean, if you think of classic technical apprenticeship yeah. and how technical apprenticeship works, that's almost certainly how hand axes were learned. I, one of my friends in graduate school thought it would be a brilliant thing to do to apprentice herself to a Japanese cabinet maker for her dissertation. What she didn't realize is that when she got there, she had to sit around the shop for a whole year and not do anything and just shut up. <laughs> but observe. Um, yeah. That's it. That is, she would just observe. That's um, not the and, way. <laughs> um, and uh, so she wrote a dissertation anyway, and it was quite good. But um, because a lot of the information is visual, tactile, um, mm -hmm. experiential, it doesn't help very much to have your dad yell at you when you're trying to fix the car. <laughs> Um, uh, it doesn't convey much information. Um, you have to learn by doing it by hand. And that's, that's still how technology is largely learned in ter terms of hand tools. But when I think of Bruce sitting there with a leather apron and he's got this stone in his hand and he's got this antler yeah. and he's talking about the nuances of striking it just so and the weight of it and the angle and, you know, all of that, I, I would, if I had to learn that just by watching i mean that and, and most stone knappers can't do that i mean yeah. he's he's remarkable in his ability to explain what he's doing yeah. most stone knappers are just can't explain it very well they say well you know you, i'm going out to this mass here <laughs> and it's obvious what i'm doing and no it isn't obvious. Have Bruce and obviously we'll it's by Bruce. practice right just because yeah. he told me doesn't right. mean i could go and do what he just did right. well, no, but no. it was interesting to but hear he, what yeah. went into it i guess yeah, yeah. So, uh, Fred, do you have a follow-up? Well, uh, I, I did have a little follow-up, and I know we're running late, so as I'll ask it as quickly <laughs> as I can, and you can answer it as quickly or as leisurely as you feel. And that is about the development of memory mm. uh, from the, I mean, how, do, how does memory actually consolidate once we, once the cognitive tools are there to associate you know, an object with with space. Well, that... I wish I had Fred Coolidge here to, to answer that question. He, he would be better. But um, if you look at the you know the cognitive science discussions of memory, there are different kinds of memory, and what we see most clearly in stone tools is what we would call long term procedural memory. Oh, long term and, procedural memory. Long term procedural memory. It's not semantic memory. It's not declarative memory. It's long term procedural memory. Um, the interesting thing, though, is is there at some point in the way when we begin to see evidence for um, sort of uh, what some of times are called audio autobiographical memories? Um, oh. They're very important for us. Uh, they're very important in modern culture. Is there any way we can see when they start making an effect on the archaeological record? Mm -hmm. And and I think when we we look at like the the horses from the Ben to Jean or the um, the Barakat Ram object, I think pretty clearly these people are working with episodic memories um, mm -hmm. and autobiographical memories. And so by half a million years ago, yes, I, I think that's certainly in place. Maybe earlier. I, mean, I know Namagor and Inbar, uh, who, is, who is an Israeli archaeologist that I know, thinks these things are much, much older. She hasn't given me a good reason yet, but he, she thinks they're well, much Well, I can older. think of a good reason, and that is that it is so complex, this neurology. We're so beautifully designed. Doesn't it take nature quite a while to put all that in It place? does, but you know, then my, my response is, you know, if, if you listen to a... A, a, a concert pianist play Chopin, it's incredibly complex. They couldn't explain what they were doing if they had to. I mean, it's basically a complex mode of procedure. 
uh, that, that you learn by practice. And a lot of what we know consists of that. And um, in fact, to the degree that it's hard to see past it, the archeological record consists almost entirely of that. Uh, and it's the other things that we really wanna see that are much harder to see. Yeah. But I would just think that that groundwork, that hard mm. wiring would start in the hominid family early on to mm. flower into what we're capable of today. I, I, I think you're right. But another way to look at it is I think working with tools over the course of hundreds of thousands and millions of that. years itself was a process that affected higher cognitive functions like yeah. autobiographical memory, episodic memory. Uh, mm -hmm. and that it was the way we scaffolded those things in the first place. Right. It's a two-way street and interactive process. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Fred. Thank you. Good questions. Uh, Todd, I know you're also an expert in tool making, so we want to hear more uh, about this at a later date with you. Yeah. Also and, com and comment tools. now, Todd. Yeah. So. I would much rather have Tom talk as opposed to me because he's he's saying some really interesting stuff and I know that there's got to be some more questions out there. So let me yield the floor back. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you both for, first of all, introducing yeah, us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, yeah. And uh, who knew that some stone tools could be so fascinating, right? Well, I didn't understand. And there was so, I understood. need a guide to really understand it because we've been in museums with cases and cases and cases of stone tools. I know. It's really boring. You have somebody walk you through it. You know you cannot decode them. Well, you have just decoded it. Decoding is a good us. word. Yeah. You have right. just shown it. I mean, the gazillion hours you and your colleagues have spent on this. Right. Took, it took to lay the groundwork to read the story that you just conveyed to us so beautifully. So you know, yeah. thank you. You it's cannot look at that and decipher it on your own. You need a guide to to spell it out. And well, then it's always it up to the dots within, right? We're always looking for a scholar who also has passion. I mean, someone <laughs> that actually, he says, yeah, I can talk about hand axes as long yeah, as you can take it. I, I got see. more if you I want more. See, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm not done by a long so shot. <laughs> <laughs> very, very, but very. But also, the, you know, the implications, and that's what I appreciate about, um, about your books. I've only read two out of the four that I have, but... Um, you know, there's so much to be deduced and so logically, and it builds on so many layers mm -hmm. of archaeological and anthropological mm -hmm. study from so many scientists around the world, from so many years of collecting and deciphering and cataloging, and um, and the cross disciplines of it. Exactly. Look at I neurology that's and that's the major issue: is we we tend not to listen to one another, and we we tell our own stories and. Uh, you know, I started working with Fred Coolidge over 20 years ago, and um, I went in directions I would have never occurred to me on my own. So the idea of interdisciplinary scholarship, I think, is very important. And the kinds Absolutely. of things that you do, you know, bring people from different fields together to talk. You get ideas, and it's, it makes a big difference. Well, and, and also just to um, embrace a sculptor and to listen to what his insights were and to lead the field. I so appreciate the innovators, the ones that are willing to step out and go, this is where the evidence leads and to break new ground. And you've certainly done that. Um, so, and I had a lot of fun doing it, I should tell you. Oh, I, I so appreciate it. And the travels that you've had, the, the objects that you've held, the, what is it like to hold a million year old artifact? Tell me about that inner experience for you. you know, it's hard to reconstruct because you know the first time I actually held one was 1973, probably. At least one that I hadn't seen before. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's, a, it, it, it's a weird feeling because it, it's a puzzle. I mean, you know how old this thing is and you know somebody made it and you wish it would talk <laughs> to tell you something, but it doesn't. Um, so it's a, it's, it, it was a, I guess, kind of a befuddling feeling more than anything else. And then, you know, I, you know, I've been studying hand axes for almost 50 years now. And um, because they just, something about them, just, I don't know what communicated to me in some kind of way that, you know, I wanted to make sense out of them. Right. So, and and even, even in more modern times, 
there's that that drive that that thing that we have is in humanity to to have that type of artistic expression that goes way way beyond function i mean when we visited like the the uh, island of malta and looked at the ancient temples there oh, yeah. and saw yeah. what all all the, why go to this effort what an amazing project <laughs> to have, have do you ever humanity. been to orkney have you ever been to orkney Question. it is the most evocative prehistoric landscape I have ever been on. Cool. Yeah. yeah, you just came back from there, did you not? No, I was just in Scotland. I didn't go to Orkney oh. this time, um, yeah. but we went down and looked at Hadrian's Wall. That's just as cool. So. <laughs> well, we go to yeah. Lascaux, and I know you can't go to the original cave, but I had to go stand at its opening and say, "My ancestors walked here." Yeah. Go to but Neo. I'm standing you on can, ground. You can still get into the cave. Uh, they take three tours a day into the cave if you go to Neo, and it's it's a wonderful. We experience. went to over a dozen uh, caves, including Neo. Yeah, yeah we went to uh, one of my uh, favorite was Benefall. Yeah, a privately owned one. But you know, here we are. We're standing. We can stand on the ground. We can breathe the air. We can look directly. You can't touch anything, but to touch, right? To actually hold something in your hands. Is another degree of intimacy oh, that yeah. we come no, the, the other thing is you want to reach out and touch it. So they, they really do have to tell you don't touch because that's what yeah, you want. Because you want to yeah. reach out and yeah. touch it. Yeah. No, we honored that. We honored that. <laughs> but um, and yeah. also the the main the other point I wanted to mention is that to see nature come forward and dialogue with you, to see a face in nature. To see a mammoth grow through just the, the drips of the minerals down a cave wall that becomes a mammoth when an eye is added, and they certainly added that eye. Or to see the mounds, you know, this is a place on the cave wall where a bison is coming through, right. and I'm just going to add with a Outlying. quick brush stroke that I, looks so they're, modern they're, they're and so contemporary to make yeah. it emerge. Yeah. There is something yeah. magical about nature emerging, about through the the right. wall the membrane to the spiritual right. world to see it emerging to have that dialogue with nature That's for what... us to stand and see the serpent cloud right emerge to 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 greet the sun which is clouded over and to see an eye pop through i know this is just symbology that we're interacting with but it's very very meaningful and so I Again. think that that is also an agency. You refer to it in your book, First Sculpture. We didn't talk about it a lot, but mm -hmm. I think that that is so meaningful and that it pings the brain in a certain way. Pattern recognition, right. the, the fact that people see Jesus in a piece of burnt toast, it's <laughs> pinging something to say there's a deep connection, there's a dialogue, it is speaking to us, there's a referential, and a um, reciprocal relationship being established. I think that is truly meaningful to us that we're set up to do. And so I think that that is also the basis for, as you point out, culture, ritual, ceremony, higher states of being, um, trance states. You refer to the sphere as saying very meaningful in the trance state because we see this as portals. We experience portals, tunnels. They're there in our cognitive makeup and for the experience of it um there's just something breathtaking about it all yeah. there's something transcendent about it all so for us to trace back to the very roots that you've been our guide for we're deeply thankful for this Tom. Well, thanks. thank you very much it was my pleasure any it's last words any yes. last words um you'd get me talking about hand axes again and then we'd never get done um <laughs> I, no, the, the only my only last last word would be that uh, archaeologists tend to be very conservative scholars, and uh, we need to be a little less conservative sometime uh, in, in order to really understand what was going on in the past. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate right. that, and thank you for being the daring scientist that you are. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so hey, much. I'm Seventy-two right. years old. I can say whatever I want now. <laughs> yeah, you have you have lifetime tenure. You can just uh, <laughs> and thank you for all the work that you and Tony have done. I just want to honor Tony and thank Tony Berlant, your your co-author on First Sculpture, um, for for really what his contributions are to the. Well, well I will give him a, a call next week and, and relay your thanks. I need to talk. Oh, to him, thank so. you. So. All right. Bye bye. Everybody, be well. Take